Introduction of the Blue Bird for Children by Georgette Leblanc. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Karina Pereira. The Blue Bird for Children by Georgette Leblanc. Translated by Alexander. They shaded much. To the teacher. The blue bird, inhabitant of the pay blue, the fabulous blue country of our dreams, is an ancient symbol in the folklore of Lorraine and stands for happiness. One of the strongest pieces of imaginative writing for children that the past decade has produced and one of the most delicate and beautiful of all times is The Blue Bird by Maurice Metterlink, written as a play and very successfully produced on the stage. Georgette Leblanc, Madame Maurice Metterlink, has rendered this play in story form for children under the title The Children's Blue Bird and in this form it has now been carefully edited and arranged for schools. Maurice Masserling was born in Ghent, Belgium, August 29, 1862. Although trained for the practice of the law and moderately successful in it, he very early became dissatisfied with the prospect of a career at the bar. In 1887, the young man moved to Paris and turned his attention to writing. Shortly after, at the death of his father, Metterlink returned to Belgium, where he has since resided most of the time. His career as an author practically began in 1889, when he published two plays. At this time he was quite unknown, except to a small circle, but soon, because of his remarkable originality, we find him being called the Belgian Shakespeare, and his reputation firmly established. Amidst his Belgian roses, he continued to work and dream, and upon his youthful dreams he built his plays. They are all shadowy, brief transcripts of emotion, and illustrate beautifully his unity of purpose, of mood and of thought. Whether in philosophy, drama or poetry, Maeterlinck is exclusively occupied in revealing or indicating the mystery which lies only just out of sight beneath the ordinary life. In order to produce this effect of the mysterious, he aims at extreme simplicity of style and a very realistic symbolism. He allows life itself to astonish us by its strangeness, by its inexplicable elements. Many of his plays are really pathetic records of unseen emotions. Of all his writings, it is conceded that the Blue Bird makes the strongest appeal to children. Maeterlinck has always had much in common with the young. He has a child's mysticism and awe of the unknown, the same delight in mechanical inventions, the same gift of making belief. In the Blue Bird, Maeterlinck takes little account of external fact. All along, he has kept the child's capacity for wonder. All along, he has preserved youth's freshness of heart. He has, therefore, never lost the key which unlocks the sympathies of childhood. He still possesses the passport that makes him free of the kingdom of Fairyland. The story of the Blue Bird may remind one somewhat of Hansel and Gretel. For here, Matterling, like Grimm, shows to us the adventures of two peasant children as they pass through regions of enchantment where they would be at the mercy of treacherous foes, but for the aid of a supernatural friend. But the originality, the charm and the interest of the blue bird depend on the way in which the author, while adapting his language and his legends to the intelligence of youthful readers, manages to show them the wonders and romance of nature. 
he enlists among his characters a whole series of inanimate objects, such as bread, sugar, milk, light, water, fire and trees, besides the cat, the dog and other animals, investing them all with individuality, making, for instance, with characteristic bias, the dog the faithful friend of his boy and girl companions, and the cat the stealthy enemy. We may not understand these characters. We may not be informed whence they came or whither they moved. There is nothing concrete or circumstantial about them. Their life is intense and consistent, but it is wholly in a spiritual character. They are mysterious with the mystery of the movements of the soul. All through the story, we are led to feel that Matling's spirit is one of grave and disinterested attachment to the highest moral beauty, and his seriousness, his serenity, and his extreme originality impress even those who are bewildered by his graces and his mysticism. The Blue Bird will forever live among Matterlink's greatest works and will linger long in the memory of all children, continuing throughout their lives to symbolize that ideal of ideals, true happiness, the happiness that comes from right seeking. End of Introduction Recorded by Karina Pereira Chapter 1 of The Bluebird for Children This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jenny Wallace The Bluebird for Children by Georgette Leblanc Translated by Alexander Teixeira de Matus The Woodcutter's Cottage Once upon a time, a woodcutter and his wife lived in their cottage on the edge of a large and ancient forest. They had two dear little children who met with a most wonderful adventure. But before telling you all about it, I must describe the children to you and let you know something of their character, for if they had not been so sweet and brave and plucky, the curious story which you are about to hear would never have happened at all. Tiltil, that was our hero's name, was ten years old, and Mitil, his little sister, was only six. Tiltil was a fine, tall little fellow, stout and well set up, with curly black hair which was often in a tangle, for he was fond of a romp. He was a great favorite because of his smiling and good-tempered face and the bright look in his eyes. But best of all, he had the ways of a bold and fearless little man which showed the noble qualities of his heart. When early in the morning he trotted along the forest road by the side of his daddy, Till the woodcutter, for all his shabby clothes he looked so proud and gallant that every beautiful thing on the earth and in the sky seemed to lie in wait for him to smile upon him as he passed. His little sister was very different, but looked ever so sweet and pretty in her long frock, which Mummy Till kept neatly patched for her. She was as fair as her brother was dark, and her large, timid eyes were blue as the forget-me-nots in the fields. Anything was enough to frighten her, and she would cry at the least thing. But her little child soul already held the highest womanly qualities. She was loving and gentle, and so fondly devoted to her brother, that rather than abandon him, she did not hesitate to undertake a long and dangerous journey in his company. What happened, and how our little hero and heroine went off into the world one night in search of happiness, that is the subject of my story. Daddy Till's cottage was the poorest of the countryside, and it seemed even more wretched because it stood opposite a splendid hall in which rich children lived. From the windows of the cottage you could see what went on inside the hall when the dining room and drawing rooms were lit up in the evening and in the daytime you saw the little children playing on the terraces, in the gardens, and in the hothouses, which people came all the way from town to visit, because they were always filled with the rarest flowers. 
Now one evening, which was not like other evenings, for it was Christmas Eve, Mummy Till put her little ones to bed, and kissed them even more lovingly than usual. She felt a little sad because, owing to the stormy weather, Daddy Till was not able to go to work in the forest, and so she had no money to buy presents with which to fill Tiltil's and Mittil's stockings. The children soon fell asleep. Everything was still and silent, and not a sound was heard but the purring of the cat, the snoring of the dog, and the ticking of the great-grandfather's clock. But suddenly a light as bright as day crept through the shutters. The lamp upon the table lit again of itself, and the two children awoke, yawned, rubbed their eyes, stretched out their arms in bed, and Tiltil in a cautious voice called, Mittil? Yes, Tiltil, was the answer. Are you asleep? Are you? No, said Tiltil. How can I be asleep when I am talking to you? I say, is this Christmas Day? asked his sister. Not yet, not till tomorrow. But Father Christmas won't bring us anything this year. Why not? I heard Mummy say that she couldn't go to town to tell him. But he will come next year. Is next year far off? A good long while, said the boy. But he will come to the rich children tonight. Really? Hello, cried Tiltil of a sudden. Mummy's forgotten to put out the lamp. I've an idea. What? Let's get up. But we mustn't, said Mittil, who always remembered. Why, there's no one about. Do you see the shutters? Oh, how bright they are! It's the lights of the party, said Tiltil. What party? The rich children opposite. It's the Christmas tree. Let's open the shutters. Can we? asked Mittil timidly. Of course we can. There's no one to stop us. Do you hear the music? Let us get up. The two children jumped out of bed, ran to the window, climbed on the stool in front of it, and threw back the shutters. A bright light filled the room, and the children looked out eagerly. We can see everything, said Tiltil. I can't, said poor little Mittil, who could hardly find room on the stool. It's snowing, said Tiltil. There are two carriages, with six horses each. There are twelve little boys getting out, said Mittil who was doing her best to peep out of the window. Don't be silly, they're little girls. They've got knickerbockers on. Oh, do be quiet, and look. What are those gold things there, hanging from the branches? Why, toys to be sure, said Tiltil. Swords, guns, soldiers, cannons. And what's that all round the table? Cakes and fruit and cream tarts. Oh, how pretty the children are, cried Mittil, clapping her hands. And how they're laughing and laughing, answered Tiltil. And the little ones dancing. Yes, yes, let's dance too, shouted Tiltil. And the two children began to stamp their feet for joy on the stool. Oh, what fun, said Mittil. They're getting the cakes, cried Tiltil. They can touch them. They're eating, they're eating, they're eating. Oh, how lovely, how lovely. Mittil began to count imaginary cakes. I have twelve, and I four times twelve, said Tiltil, but I'll give you some. And our little friends, dancing, laughing, and shrieking with delight, rejoiced so prettily in the other children's happiness that they forgot their own poverty and want. They were soon to have their reward. Suddenly there came a loud knocking at the door. The startled children ceased their romp, and dared not move a limb. Then the big wooden latch lifted of itself. With a loud creak, the door opened slowly, and in crept a little old woman, dressed all in green, with a red hood over her head. She was humpbacked and lame, and had only one eye, her nose and chin almost touched, and she walked, leaning on a stick. She was surely a fairy. 
She hobbled up to the children and asked in a snuffling voice, Have you the grass here that sings or the bird that is blue? We have some grass, replied Tiltil, trembling all over his body, but it can't sing. Tiltil has a bird, said Mittil. But I can't give it away because it's mine, the little fellow added quickly. Now wasn't that a capital reason? The fairy put on her big round glasses and looked at the bird. He's not blue enough, she exclaimed. I must absolutely have the bluebird. It's for my little girl, who is very ill. Do you know what the bluebird stands for? No, I thought you didn't. And as you are good children, I will tell you. The fairy raised her crooked finger to her long pointed nose and whispered in a mysterious tone. The bluebird stands for happiness, and I want you to understand that my little girl must be happy in order to get well. That is why I now command you to go out into the world and find the bluebird for her. You will have to start at once. Do you know who I am? The children exchanged puzzled glances. The fact was that they had never seen a fairy before, and they felt a little scared in her presence. However, Tiltil soon said politely, You are rather like our neighbor, Madame Berlingot. Tiltil thought that, in saying this, he was paying the fairy a compliment. For Madame Berlingot's shop, which was next door to their cottage, was a very pleasant place. It was stocked with sweets, marbles, chocolate cigars, and sugar dolls and hens. And at fair time there were big gingerbread dolls covered all over with gilt paper. Goody Berlingot had a nose that was quite as ugly as the fairy's, and she was old also, and like the fairy she walked doubled up in two. But she was very kind, and she had a dear little girl who used to play on Sundays with the woodcutter's children. Unfortunately, the poor little pretty fair-haired thing was always suffering from some unknown complaint, which often kept her in bed. When this happened, she used to beg and pray for Tiltil's dove to play with, but Tiltil was so fond of the bird that he would not give it to her. All this, thought the boy, was very like that which the fairy told him, and that was why he called her Berlingot. Much to his surprise, the fairy turned crimson with rage. It was a hobby of hers to be like nobody, because she was a fairy and able to change her appearance from one moment to the next as she pleased. That evening she happened to be ugly and old and humpbacked. She had lost one of her eyes, and two lean wisps of gray hair hung over her shoulders. "'What do I look like?' she asked Tiltil. Am I pretty or ugly, old or young? Her reason for asking these questions was to try the kindness of the little boy. He turned away his head and dared not say what he thought of her looks. Then she cried, I am the fairy Berryloon. Oh, that's all right, answered Tiltil, who by this time was shaking in every limb. This satisfied the fairy, and as the children, who were still in their nightshirts, she told them to get dressed. She herself helped Mithil, and while she did so, asked, Where are your father and mother? In there, said Tiltil, pointing to the door on the right. They are asleep. And your granddad and granny? They are dead. And your little brothers and sisters? Have you any? Oh, yes. Three little brothers, said Tiltil, and four little sisters, added Mithil. Where are they? asked the fairy. They are dead, too, answered Tiltil. Would you like to see them again? Oh, yes, at once. Show them to us. I haven't them in my pocket, said the fairy. But this is very lucky. You will see them when you go through the land of memory. It's on the way to the bluebird, just on the left, past the third turning. What were you doing when I knocked? We were playing at eating cakes, said Tiltil. Have you any cakes? Where are they? In the house of the rich children. Come and look, it's so lovely. And Tiltil dragged the fairy to the window. 
but it's the others who are eating them said she yes but we can see them eat said tyltyl aren't you cross with them what for for eating all the cakes i think it's very wrong of them not to give you any not at all they're rich i say isn't it beautiful over there it's just the same here only you can't see yes i can said tyltyl i have very good eyes i can see the time on the church clock and daddy can't the fairy suddenly grew angry i tell you that you can't see she said and she grew angrier and angrier as though it mattered about seeing the time on the church clock of course the little boy was not blind but as he was kind-hearted and deserved to be happy she wanted to teach him to see what is good and beautiful in all things it was not an easy task for she well knew that most people live and die without enjoying the happiness that lies all around them still as she was a fairy she was all-powerful and so she decided to give him a little hat adorned with a magic diamond that would possess the extraordinary property of always showing him the truth which would help him to see the inside of things and thus teach him that each of them has a life and an existence of its own created to match and gladden ours the fairy took the little hat from a great bag hanging by her side it was green and had a white cockade with the big diamond shining in the middle of it tyltyl was beside himself with delight the fairy explained to him how the diamond worked by pressing the top you saw the soul of things if you gave it a little turn to the right you discovered the past and when you turned it to the left you beheld the future tyltyl beamed all over his face and danced for joy and then he at once became afraid of losing the little hat daddy will take it from me he cried no said the fairy for no one can see it as long as it's on your head will you try it yes yes cried the children clapping their hands the hat was no sooner on the little boy's head than a magic change came over everything the old fairy turned into a young and beautiful princess dressed all in silk and covered with sparkling jewels the walls of the cottage home became transparent and gleamed like precious stones the humble deal furniture shone like marble the two children ran from right to left clapping their hands and shouting with delight oh how lovely how lovely exclaimed tyltyl and mytyl like the vain little thing she was stood spellbound before the beauty of the fair princess's dress but further and much greater surprises were in store for them had not the fairy said that the things and the animals would come to life talk and behave like everybody else lo and behold suddenly the door of the grandfather clock opened the silence was filled with the sweetest music and twelve little daintily dressed and laughing dancers began to skip and spin all around the children they are the hours of your life said the fairy may i dance with them asked tyltyl gazing with admiration at those pretty creatures who seemed to skim over the floor like birds but just then he burst into a wild fit of laughter who was that funny fat fellow all out of breath and covered with flour who came struggling out of the bread pan and bowing to the children it was bread bread himself taking advantage of the reign of liberty to go for a little walk on earth he looked like a stout comical old gentleman his face was puffed out with dough and his large hands at the end of his thick arms were not able to meet when he laid them on his great round stomach he was dressed in a tight-fitting crust-colored suit with stripes across the chest like those on the nice buttered rolls which we have for breakfast in the morning on his head just think of it he wore an enormous bun which made a funny sort of turban he had hardly tumbled out of his pan when other loaves just like him but smaller followed after and began to frisk about with the hours without giving a thought to the flour which they scattered over those pretty ladies and which wrapped them in great white clouds it was a queer and charming dance and the children were delighted the hours waltzed with the loaves 
the plates joining in the fun hopped up and down on the dresser at the risk of falling off and smashing to pieces the glasses in the cupboard clinked together to drink the health of one and all as to the forks they chattered so loudly with the knives that you could not hear yourself speak for the noise there is no knowing what would have happened if the din had lasted much longer daddy and mummy till would certainly have waked up fortunately when the romp was at its height an enormous flame darted out of the chimney and filled the room with a great red glow as though the house were on fire everybody bolted into the corners in dismay while tiltil and mitil sobbing with fright hid their heads under the good fairy's cloak don't be afraid she said it's only fire who has come to join in your fun he is a good sort but you had better not touch him for he has a hot temper peeping anxiously through the beautiful gold lace that edged the fairy's cloak the children saw a tall red fellow looking at them and laughing at their fears he was dressed in scarlet tights and spangles from his shoulders hung silk scarves that were just like flames when he waved them with his long arms and his hair stood up on his head in straight flaring locks he started flinging out his arms and legs and jumping round the room like a madman tiltil though feeling a little easier dared not yet leave his refuge then the fairy berylune had a capital idea she pointed her wand at the tap and at once there appeared a young girl who wept like a regular fountain it was water she was very pretty but she looked extremely sad and she sang so sweetly that it was like the rippling of a spring her long hair which fell to her feet might have been made of seaweed she had nothing on her but her bedgown but the water that streamed over her clothed her in shimmering colors she hesitated at first and gave a glance around her then catching sight of fire still whirling about like a great madcap she made an angry and indignant rush at him spraying his face splashing and wetting him with all her might fire flew into a rage and began to smoke nevertheless as he found himself suddenly thwarted by his old enemy he thought it wiser to retire to a corner water also beat a retreat and it seemed as though peace would be restored once more the two children at last recovering from their alarm were asking the fairy what was going to happen next when a startling noise of breaking crockery made them look round towards the table what a surprise the milk jug lay on the floor smashed into a thousand fragments and from the pieces rose a charming lady who gave little screams of terror and clasped her hands and turned up her eyes with a beseeching glance tiltil hastened to console her for he at once knew that she was milk and as he was very fond of her he gave her a good kiss she was as fresh and pretty as a little dairymaid and a delicious scent of hay came from her white frock all covered with cream meanwhile mytyl was watching the sugar loaf which also seemed to be coming to life packed in its blue paper wrapper on a shelf near the door it was swaying from left to right and from right to left without any result but at last a long thin arm was seen to come out followed by a peaked head which split the paper and by another arm and two long legs that seemed never to end oh you should have seen how funny sugar looked so funny indeed that the children could not help laughing in his face and yet they would have liked to be civil to him for they heard the fairy introducing him in these words this tiltil is the soul of sugar his pockets are crammed with sugar and each of his fingers is a sugar stick how wonderful to have a friend all made of sugar off whom you can bite a piece whenever you feel inclined bow wow wow good morning good morning my little god at last at last we can talk bark and wag my tail as i might you never understood i love you i love you who can this extraordinary person be who jostles everybody and fills the house with his noisy gaiety we know him at once it is tylo the good dog who tries his hardest to understand mankind the good-natured animal who goes with the children to the forest the faithful guardian who protects the door 
the staunch friend who is ever true and ever loyal. Here he comes, walking on his hind paws, as on a pair of legs too short for him, and beating the air with the two others, making gestures like a clumsy little man. He has not changed. He still has his smooth, mustard-colored coat and his jolly bulldog head with the black muzzle. But he is much bigger, and then he talks. He talks as fast as he can, as though he wanted in one moment to avenge his whole race, which has been doomed to silence for centuries. He talks of everything now that he is at last able to explain himself, and it is a pretty sight to see him kissing his little master and mistress, and calling them his little gods. He sits up, he jumps about the room, knocking against the furniture, upsetting Mittel with his big soft paws, lolling his tongue, wagging his tail, and puffing and panting as though he were out hunting. We at once see his simple, generous nature. Persuaded of his own importance, he fancies that he alone is indispensable in the new world of things. After making all the fuss he wanted of the children, he started going the round of the company, distributing the attentions which he thought that none could do without. His joy, now set free, found vent without restraint, and because he was the most loving of creatures, he would also have been the happiest if, in becoming human, he had not unfortunately retained his little doggy failings. He was jealous. He was terribly jealous, and his heart felt a pang when he saw Tillet, the cat, coming to life in her turn, and being petted and kissed by the children, just as he had been. Oh, how he hated the cat! To bear the sight of her beside him, to see her always sharing in the affection of the family. That was the great sacrifice which fate demanded of him. He accepted it, however, without a word, because it pleased his little gods, and he went so far as to leave her alone. But he had many a crime on his conscience because of her. Had he not, one evening, crept stealthily into Goody Burlingott's kitchen in order to throttle her old tomcat, who had never done him any harm? Had he not broken the back of the Persian cat at the hall opposite? Did he not sometimes go to town on purpose to hunt cats, and put an end to them, all to wreak his spite? And now Tillet was going to talk, just like himself. Tillet would be his equal in the new world that was opening before him. Oh, there's no justice left in the world, was his bitter thought. There is no justice left. In the meantime, the cat, who had begun by washing herself and polishing her claws, calmly put out her paw to the little girl. She really was a very pretty cat, and if our friend Tylo's jealousy had not been such an ugly feeling— we might almost have overlooked it for once. How could you fail to be attracted by Tillet's eyes, which were like topaz set in emeralds? How could you resist the pleasure of stroking the wonderful black velvet back? How could you not love her grace, her gentleness, and the dignity of her poses? Smiling gently and speaking in well-chosen language, she said to Mathilde, "'Good morning, miss.' How well you look this morning. And the children patted her like anything. Tylo kept watching the cat from the other end of the room. Now that she's standing on her hind legs like a man, he muttered, she looks just like the devil, with her pointed ears, her long tail, and her dress as black as ink. And he could not help growling between his teeth. She's also like the village chimney-sweep, he went on whom I loathe and detest, and whom I shall never take for a real man, whatever my little gods may say. It's lucky, he added with a sigh, that I know more about a good many things than they do. But suddenly, no longer able to master himself, he flew at the cat and shouted with a loud laugh that was more like a roar. I am going to frighten Tillet. Bow, wow, wow! But the cat— who was dignified even when still an animal, now thought herself called to the loftiest destinies. She considered that the time had come to raise a tall barrier between herself and the dog, who had never been more than an ill-bred person in her eyes, 
and stepping back in disdain, she just said, Sir, I don't know you. Tylo gave a bound under the insult, whereupon the cat bristled up, twisting her whiskers under her little pink nose, for she was very proud of those two pale blotches which gave a special touch to her dark beauty. And then, arching her back and sticking up her tail, she hissed out, Fft, Fft, and stood stock still on the chest of drawers like a dragon on the lid of a Chinese vase. Tiltil and Mittil screamed with laughter, but the quarrel would certainly have had a bad ending if at that moment a great thing had not happened. At eleven o'clock in the evening, in the middle of that winter's night, a great light, the light of the noonday sun, glowing and dazzling, burst into the cottage. "'Hello, there's daylight,' said the little boy, who no longer knew what to make of things. "'What will Daddy say?' But before the fairy had time to set him right, Tiltil understood, and full of wonderment, he knelt before the latest vision that bewitched his eyes. At the window, in the center of a great halo of sunshine, there rose slowly, like a tall golden sheaf, a maiden of surpassing loveliness. Gleaming veils covered her figure without hiding its beauty. Her bare arms, stretched in the attitude of giving, seemed transparent and her great clear eyes wrapped all upon whom they fell in a fond embrace. "'It's the queen,' said Tiltil. "'It's a fairy princess,' cried Mytil, kneeling beside her brother. "'No, my children,' said the fairy. "'It is Light.' Smiling, Light stepped towards the two little ones. She, the light of heaven, the strength and beauty of the earth, was proud of the humble mission entrusted to her, she, never before held captive, living in space, and bestowing her bounty upon all alike, consented to be confined for a brief spell within a human shape, so as to lead the children out into the world, and teach them to know that other light, the light of the mind, which we never see, but which helps us to see all things that are. "'It is light!' exclaimed the things and the animals and, as they all loved her, they began to dance around her with cries of pleasure. Tiltil and Mytil capered with joy. Never had they pictured so amusing and so pretty a party, and they shouted louder than all the rest. Then what was bound to happen came. Suddenly three knocks were heard against the wall, loud enough to throw the house down. It was Daddy Till, who had been waked up by the din, and who was now threatening to come and put a stop to it. "'Turn the diamond!' cried the fairy to Tiltil. Our hero hastened to obey, but he had not the knack of it yet. Besides, his hand shook at the thought that his father was coming. In fact, he was so awkward that he nearly broke the works. "'Not so quick, not so quick,' said the fairy. "'Oh, dear, you've turned it too briskly.' They will not have time to resume their places, and we shall have a lot of bother. There was a general stampede. The walls of the cottage lost their splendor. All ran hither and thither to return to their proper shape. Fire could not find his chimney. Water ran about looking for her tap. Sugar stood moaning in front of his torn wrapper. And bread, the biggest of the loaves, was unable to squeeze into his pan, in which the other loaves had jumped higgledy-piggledy, taking up all the room. As for the dog, he had grown too large for the hole in his kennel, and the cat also could not get into her basket. The hours alone, who were accustomed always to run faster than man wished, had slipped back into the clock without delay. Light stood motionless and unruffled, vainly setting an example of calmness to the others, who were all weeping and wailing around the fairy. "'What is going to happen?' they asked. "'Is there any danger?' "'Well,' said the fairy, "'I am bound to tell you the truth. All those who accompany the two children will die at the end of the journey.' They began to cry like anything, all except the dog, who was delighted at remaining human as long as possible, and who had already taken his stand next to Light, so as to be sure of going in front of his little master and mistress. At that moment there came a knocking even more dreadful than before. "'There's Daddy again,' said Tiltil. "'He's getting up this time. I can hear him walking.' 
you see said the fairy you have no choice now it is too late you must all start with us but you fire don't come near anybody you dog don't tease the cat you water try not to run all over the place and you sugar stop crying unless you want to melt bread shall carry the cage in which to put the bluebird and you shall all come to my house where i will dress the animals and the things properly let us go out this way as she spoke she pointed her wand at the window which lengthened magically downwards like a door they all went out on tiptoe after which the window resumed its usual shape and so it came about that on christmas night in the clear light of the moon while the bells rang out lustily proclaiming the birth of jesus tiltil and mitil went in search of the bluebird that was to bring them happiness end of the woodcutter's cottage box recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org The Bluebird for Children Written by George H. LeBlanc Edited by Frederick Orville Perkins And translated by Alexander Teixeira de Matos Chapter 2 At the Fairies Read by Ian King The fairy Berylin's palace stood at the top of a very high mountain on the way to the moon it was so near that on summer nights when the sky was clear you could plainly see the moon's mountains and valleys lakes and seas from the terrace of the palace here the fairy studied the stars and read their secrets for it was long since the earth had had anything to teach her this old planet no longer interests me she used to say to her friends the giants of the mountain the men upon it still live with their eyes shut poor things i pity them i go down among them now and then but it is not of charity to try and save the little children from the fatal misfortune that awaits them in the darkness this explains why she had come and knocked at the door of daddy till's cottage on christmas eve and now to return to our travellers they had hardly reached the high road when the fairy remembered that they could not walk like that through the village which was still lit up because of the feast but her store of knowledge was so great that all her wishes were fulfilled at once she pressed lightly on tiltil's head and willed that they should all be carried by magic to her palace then and there a cloud of fireflies surrounded our companions and wafted them gently towards the sky they were at the fairy's palace before they had recovered from their surprise follow me she said and led them through the chambers and passengers all in gold and silver they stopped in a large room surrounded with mirrors on every side and containing an enormous wardrobe with light creeping through its chinks the fairy Berylin took a diamond key from her pocket and opened the wardrobe. One cry of amazement burst from every throat. Precious stuffs were seen piled one on top of the other, mantles covered with gems, dresses of every sort and every country, pearl coronets, emerald necklaces, ruby bracelets. Never had the children beheld such riches. As for the things, their state was rather one of utter bewilderment, and this was only natural. When you think that they were seeing the world for the first time, and that it showed itself to them in such a queer way, the fairy helped them make their choice. Fire, sugar, and the cat displayed a certain decision of taste. Fire, who only cared for red, at once chose a splendid bright red dress, with gold spangles. He put nothing on his head, for his head was always very hot. Sugar could not stand anything except white and pale blue. Bright colours jarred on his sweet nature. The long blue and white dress which he selected, and the pointed hat, 
like a candle extinguisher which he wore on his head made him look perfectly ridiculous but he was too silly to notice it and kept spinning before the glass like a top and admiring himself in blissful ignorance the cat who was always a lady and who was used to her dusky garments reflected that black always looks well in any circumstance particularly now when they were travelling without luggage she therefore put on a suit of black tights with jet embroidery hung a long velvet cloak from her shoulders and perched a large cavalier hat with a long feather on her neat little head she next asked for a pair of soft kid boots in memory of puss in boots her distinguished ancestor and put a pair of gloves on her forepaws to protect them from the dust of the roads thus attired she took a satisfied glance at the mirror then a little nervously with her anxious eye and her quivering pink nose she hastily invited sugar and fire to take the air with her so they all three walked out while the others went on dressing let us follow them for a moment for we have already grown to like our brave little tiltil and we shall want to hear anything that is likely to help or delay his undertaking after passing through several splendid galleries hung like balconies in the sky our three cronies stopped in the hall and the cat at once addressed the meeting in a hushed voice i have brought you here she said in order to discuss the position in which we are placed let us make the most of our last moment of liberty but she was interrupted by a furious uproar oh wow wow there now cried the cat there's that idiot of a dog he has scented us out we can't get a minute's peace let us hide behind the balustrade he had better not hear what i have to say to you it's too late said sugar who was standing by the door and sure enough tyler was coming up jumping barking panting and delighted the cat when she saw him turned away in disgust he has put on the livery of one of the footmen of cinderella's coach it is just the thing for him he has the soul of a flunkey she ended these words with a pss, pss, and stroking her whiskers took up her stand with a defiant air between sugar and fire the good dog did not see her little game he was wholly wrapped up in the pleasure of being gorgeously arrayed and he danced round and round it was really funny to see his velvet cloak whirling like a merry-go-round with the skirts opening every now and then and showing his little stumpy tail which was all the more expressive as it had to express itself very briefly for i need hardly tell you that tylo like every well-bred bulldog had had his tail and his ears cropped as a puppy poor fellow he had long envied the tails of his brother dogs which allowed them to use a much larger and more varied vocabulary but physical deficiencies and the hardships of fortune strengthened our innermost qualities tylo's soul having no outward means of expressing itself had only gained through silence and his look which was always filled with love had become very eloquent Today, his big dark eyes glistened with delight he had suddenly changed into a man he was all over magnificent clothes and he was about to perform a grand errand across the world in company with the gods there he said there aren't we fine just look at this lace and embroidery it's real gold and no mistake he did not see that the others were laughing at him for to tell the truth he did look very comical but like all simple creatures he had no sense of humour he was so proud of his natural garment of yellow hair that he had put on no waistcoat in order that no one might have a doubt as to where he sprang from for the same reason he had kept his collar with his address on it a big red velvet coat heavily braided with gold lace reached to his knees and the large pockets on either side would enable him he thought always to carry a few provisions for tyler was very greedy on his left ear he wore a little round cap with an osprey feather in it and he kept it on his big square head by means of an elastic which cut his fat loose cheeks in two his other ear remained free 
cropped close to his head in the shape of a little paper screw bag this ear was the watchful receiver into which all the sounds of life fell like pebbles disturbing its rest he had also encased his hind legs in a pair of patent leather riding boots with white tops but his forepaws he considered of such use that nothing would have induced him to put them into gloves tylo had too natural a character to change his little ways all in a day and in spite of his new blown honours he allowed himself to do undignified things he was at the present moment lying on the steps of the hall scratching the ground and sniffing at the wall when suddenly he gave a start and began to whine and whimper his lower lip shook nervously as though he were going to cry what's the matter with the idiot now asked the cat who was watching him out of the corner of her eye but she at once understood a very sweet song came from the distance and tylo could not endure music the song drew nearer a girl's fresh voice filled the shadows of the lofty arches and water appeared tall slender and white as a pearl she seemed to glide rather than to walk her movements were so soft and graceful that they were suspected rather than seen a beautiful silvery dress waved and floated around her and her hair decked with corals flowed below her knees when fire caught sight of her like the rude and spiteful fellow he was he sneered she's not brought her umbrella but water who was really quite witty and who knew that she was the stronger of the two chafed him pleasantly and said with a glance at his glowing nose i beg your pardon i thought you might be speaking of a great red nose i saw the other day the others began to laugh and poke fun at fire whose face was always like a red-hot coal fire angrily jumped to the ceiling keeping his revenge for later meanwhile the cat went up to water very cautiously and paid her ever so many compliments on her dress i need hardly tell you that she did not mean a word of it but she wished to be friendly with everybody for she wanted their votes to carry out her plan and she was anxious at not seeing bread because she did not want to speak before the meeting was complete what can he be doing she meowed time after time he was making an endless fuss about choosing his dress said the dog at last he decided in favour of a turkish robe with a sycamore and a turban the words were not out of his mouth when a shapeless and ridiculous bulk clad in all the colours of the rainbow came and blocked the narrow door of the hall it was the enormous stomach of bread who filled the whole opening he kept on knocking himself without knowing why for he was not very clever and besides he was not very used to moving about in human beings houses at last it occurred to him to stoop and by squeezing through sideways he managed to make his way into the hall it was certainly not a triumphal entry but he was pleased with it all the same here i am he said here i am i have put on blue beard's finest dress what do you think of this the dog began to frisk around him he thought bread magnificent that yellow velvet costume covered all over with silver crescents reminded tylo of the delicious horseshoe rolls which he loved and the huge gaudy turban on bread's head was really very like a fairy bun how nice he looks he cried how nice he looks bread was shyly followed by milk her simple mind had made her prefer her cream dress to all the finery which the fairy suggested to her she was really a model of humility bread was beginning to talk about the dresses of tiltil light and mitel when the cat cut him short in a masterful voice we shall see them in good time she said stop chattering listen to me time presses our future is at stake they all looked at her with a bewildered air they understood that it was a solemn moment but the human language was still full of mystery to them sugar wriggled his long fingers as a sign of distress bread patted his huge stomach water lay on the floor and seemed to suffer from the most profound despair and milk only had eyes for bread who had been her friend for ages and ages the cat becoming impatient continued her speech 
the fairy has just said it the end of this journey will at the same time mark the end of our lives it is our business therefore to spin the journey out as long as possible and by every means in our power bread who was afraid of being eaten as soon as he was no longer a man hastened to express approval but the dog who was standing a little way off pretending not to hear began to growl deep down in his soul he knew what the cat was driving at and when tylet ended her speech with the words we must at all costs prolong the journey and prevent bluebird from being found even if it means endangering the lives of the children the good dog obeying only the promptings of his heart leapt at the cat to bite her sugar bread and fire lunged themselves between them order order said bread pompously i'm in the chair at this meeting who made you chairman stormed fire who asked you to interfere asked water whirling her wet hair over fire excuse me said sugar shaking all over in consolatory tones excuse me this is a serious moment let us talk things over in a friendly way i quite agree with sugar and the cat said bread as though that ended the matter this is ridiculous said the dog barking and showing his teeth there is man and that's all we have to obey him and do as he tells us i recognize no one but him hooray for man man forever in life or death all for man man is everything but the cat's shrill voice rose above all the others she was full of grudges against man and she wanted to make use of the short spell of humanity which she now enjoyed to avenge her whole race all of us here present she cried animals things and elements possess a soul which man does not yet know that is why we retain a remnant of independence but if he finds the blue bird he will know all and he will see all and we shall be completely at his mercy remember the time when he wandered at liberty upon the face of the earth but suddenly her face changed her voice sank to a whisper and she hissed <laughs> look out i hear the fairy and light coming i need hardly tell you that light has taken sides with man and means to stand by him she is our worst enemy be careful but our friends had had no practice in trickery and feeling themselves in the wrong took up such ridiculous and uncomfortable attitudes that the fairy the moment she appeared upon the threshold exclaimed what are you doing in that corner you look like a pack of conspirators quite scared and thinking that the fairy had already guessed their wicked intentions they fell upon their knees before her luckily for them the fairy hardly gave a thought to what was passing through their little minds she had come to explain the first part of the journey to the children and to tell each of the others what to do tiltil and mytil stood hand in hand in front of her looking a little frightened and a little awkward in their fine clothes they stared at each other in childish admiration the little girl was wearing a yellow silk frock embroidered with pink posies and covered with gold spangles on her head was a lovely orange velvet cap and a starched muslin tucker covered her little arms tiltal was dressed in a red jacket and blue knickerbockers both of velvet and of course he wore the wonderful little hat on his head the fairy said to them it is just possible that the blue bird is hiding at your grandparents in the land of memory so you will go there first but how shall we see them if they are dead asked tiltil then the good fairy explained that they would not really be dead until their grandchildren ceased to think of them men do not know this secret she added but thanks to the diamond you tiltil will see that the dead whom we remember live as happily as though they were not dead are you coming with us asked the boy turning to light who stood in the doorway and lit up all the hall no said the fairy light must not look at the past 
her energies must be devoted to the future the two children were starting on their way when they discovered that they were very hungry the fairy at once ordered bread to give them something to eat and that big fat fellow delighted with the importance of his duty undid the top of his robe drew his scimitar and cut two slices out of his stomach the children screamed with laughter tylo dropped his gloomy thoughts for a moment and begged for a bit of bread and everybody struck up the farewell chorus sugar who was very full of himself also wanted to impress the company and breaking off two of his fingers handed them to the astonished children as they were all moving towards the door the fairy berylin stopped them not today she said the children must go alone it will be indiscreet to accompany them they are going to spend the evening with their late family come be off good-bye dear children and mind that you are back in good time it is extremely important the two children took each other by the hand and carrying the big cage passed out of the hall and their companions at a sign from the fairy filed in front of her to return to the palace our friend tylo was the only one who did not answer to his name the moment he heard the fairy say that the children were to go alone he had made up his mind to go and look after them whatever happened and while the others were saying good-bye he hid himself behind the door but the poor fellow had reckoned without the all-seeing eyes of the fairy berylin tylo she cried tylo here and the poor dog who had so long been used to obey dared not resist the command and came with his tail between his legs to take his place among the others he howled with despair when he saw his little master and mistress swallowed up in the great gold staircase End of chapter two read by ian king is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Bluebird for Children Written by George H. LeBlanc Edited by Frederick Orville Perkins And translated by Alexander Teixeira de Matos Chapter 3 The Land of Memory read by ian king the fairy berry lynn had told the children that the land of memory was not far off but to reach it you had to go through a forest that was so dense and so old that your eyes could not see the tops of the trees it was always shrouded in a heavy mist and the children would certainly have lost their way if the fairy had not said to them beforehand it is straight ahead and there is only one road the ground was carpeted with flowers which were all alike they were snow-white pansies and very pretty but as they never saw the sun they had no scent those little flowers comforted the children who felt extremely lonely a great mysterious silence surrounded them and they trembled a little with a very pleasant sense of fear which they had never felt before let's take granny a bunch of flowers said mytel that's a good idea she will be pleased cried tyltyl and as they walked along the children gathered a beautiful white nosegay the dear little things did not know that every pansy which means a thought that they picked brought them nearer to their grandparents and they soon saw before them a large oak with a notice board nailed to it here we are cried the boy in triumph as climbing up on the root he read the land of memory they arrived but they turned to every side without seeing a thing i can see nothing at all whimpered mytel i'm cold i'm tired i don't want to travel any more tyltyl who was wholly wrapped up in his errand lost his temper come don't keep crying just like water you ought to be ashamed of yourself he said there look look the fog is lifting and sure enough the mist parted before their eyes like veils torn by an invisible hand the big trees faded away everything vanished 
and instead there appeared a pretty little peasant's cottage covered with creepers and standing in a little garden filled with flowers and with trees all over fruit the children at once knew the dear cow in the orchard the watchdog at the door the blackbird in his wicker cage and everything was steeped in a pale light and a warm balmy air tyltyl and mytyl stood amazed so that was the land of memory what lovely weather it was and how nice it felt to be there they at once made up their minds to come back often now that they knew the way but how great was their happiness when the last veil disappeared and they saw at a few steps from them grandad and granny sitting on a bench sound asleep they clapped their hands and called out gleefully <gasps> it's grandad it's granny there they are there they are but they were a little scared by this great piece of magic and dared not move from behind the tree and they stood looking at the dear old couple who woke up gently and slowly under their eyes then they heard granny till's trembling voice say i have a notion that our grandchildren who are still alive are coming to see us today and gaffer till answered they are certainly thinking of us for i feel queer and i have pins and needles in my legs i think they must be quite near said granny for i see tears of joy dancing before my eyes and <gasps> granny had not time to finish her sentence the children were in her arms what joy what wild kisses and huggings what a wonderful surprise the happiness was too great for words they laughed and tried to speak and kept on looking at one another with delighted eyes it was so glorious and so unexpected to meet again like this when the first excitement was over they all began to talk at once how tall and strong you've grown tell said granny and grandad cried and mytil just look at her what pretty hair what pretty eyes and the children danced and clapped their hands and flung themselves by turns into the arms of one or the other at last they quieted down a little and with mytil nestling against grandad's chest and tyltyl comfortably perched on granny's knees they began to talk of family affairs how are daddy and mummy tall asked granny quite well granny said tyltyl they were asleep when we went out granny gave them fresh kisses and said my word how pretty they are and how nice and clean why don't you come to see us oftener it is months and months now that you have forgotten us and that we have seen nobody we couldn't granny said tyltyl and today it's only because of the fairy we are always here said granny till waiting for a visit from those who are alive the last time you were here was on all hallows all hallows we didn't go out that day for we both had colds but but you thought of us and every time you think of us we wake up and see you again tyltyl remembered that the fairy had told him this he had not thought it possible then but now with his head on the heart of the dear granny whom he had missed so much he began to understand things and he felt that his grandparents had not left him altogether he asked so you are not really dead the old couple burst out laughing when they exchanged their life on earth for another and a much nicer and more beautiful life they had forgotten the word dead what does that word dead mean asked gaffer till why it means that one's no longer alive said tyltyl grandad and granny only shrugged their shoulders how stupid, oh, how the, stupid living are, the living are when they speak of the others was all they said and they went over their memories again rejoicing and being able to chat all old people love discussing old times the future is finished as far as they are concerned and so they delight in the present and the past but we are growing impatient like tyltyl and instead of listening to them we will follow our little friend's movements he had jumped off granny's knee and was poking about in every corner delighted at finding all sorts of things which he knew and remembered nothing has changed everything is in its old place he cried and as he had not been to the old people's home for so long everything struck him as much nicer and he added 
in the voice of one who knows only everything is prettier hello there's the clock with the big hand which i broke the point off and the hole which i made in the door the day i found grandad's gimlet yes you've done some damage in your time said grandad and there's the plum tree which you were so fond of climbing when i wasn't looking meantime tyltyl was not forgetting his errand you haven't the bluebird here by chance i suppose at the same moment, Mytil lifted her head, saw a cage. Hello, there's the old blackbird. Does he still sing? As she spoke, the blackbird woke up and began to sing at the top of his voice. You see, said Granny, as soon as one thinks of him, Tiltil was simply amazed at what he saw. But he's blue, he shouted. Why, that's the bird, the blue bird. He's blue, blue, blue as the blue glass marble. Will you give him to me? The grandparents gladly consented, and full of triumph, Tiltil went and fetched the cage which he had left by the tree. He took hold of the precious bird with the greatest of care, and it began to hop about in its new home. How pleased the fairy will be, said the boy, rejoicing at his conquest. And light, too. Come along, come along, said the grandparents. Come. And look at the cow. Come and, and look at the, the cow bees. and the bees. As the old couple were beginning to toddle across the garden, the children suddenly asked if their little dead brothers and sisters were there too. At the same moment, seven little children, who up to then had been sleeping in the house, came tearing like mad into the garden. Tiltil and Mytil ran up to them. They all hustled and hugged one another and danced and whirled about and uttered screams of joy. Here they are, here they are, said Granny. As soon as you speak of them, they are there, the imps. Tiltil caught a little one by the hair. Hello, Pierrot. So we're going to fight again, as in the olden days. And Robert, I say, Jean, what's become of your top? Madeline and Peretti and Pauline. And here's Rickett. Mytel laughed. <laughs> Rickett's still crawling on all fours. <laughs> Tiltil noticed a little dog yapping around them. There's Kiki, whose tail I cut off with Pauline's scissors. He hasn't changed either. No, said Gaffer Till in a voice of great importance. Nothing changes here. But suddenly, amid the general rejoicings, the old people stopped, spellbound. They had heard the small voice of the clock and doors strike eight. How's this? They asked. How's this? It never strikes nowadays. That's because we no longer think of the time, said Granny. Was anyone thinking of the time? Yes, I was, said Tiltil. So it's eight o'clock. <gasps> then I'm off, for I promised Light to be back before nine. He was going for the cage, but the others were too happy to let him run away so soon. It would be horrid to say goodbye like that. Granny had a good idea. She knew what a little glutton Tiltil was. It was just supper time, and as luck would have it, there was some capital cabbage soup and a beautiful plum tart. Well, said our hero, as I've got the bluebird, and cabbage soup is a thing you don't have every day. They all hurried and carried the table outside and laid it with a nice white tablecloth and put a plate for each. And lastly, Granny brought out the steaming soup tureen in state. The lamp was lit, and the grandparents and grandchildren sat down to supper, jostling and elbowing one another, and laughing and shouting with pleasure. Then, for a time, nothing was heard but the sound of the wooden spoons noisily clattering against the soup plates. Oh, how good it is! Oh, how good it is! shouted Tiltil who was eating greedily. I want some more, 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 more. A little more quiet, said Grandad. You're just as ill-behaved as ever, and you'll break your plate. Tiltul took no notice of the remark, stood up on his stool, caught hold of the terrine and dragged it towards him and upset it, and the hot soup trickled all over the table and down upon everybody's lap. The children yelled and screamed with pain. Granny was quite scared, and Grandad was furious. He dealt our friend Tiltil a tremendous box on the ear. Tiltil was staggered for a moment, and then he put his hand to his cheek with a look of rapture and exclaimed, Grandad, how good, how jolly. 
It was just like the slaps you used to give me when you were alive. I must give you a kiss for it. Everybody laughed. There's more where that came from, if you like them, said Grandad grumpily. But he was touched all the same and turned to wipe a tear from his eyes. Goodness! cried Tiltil, starting up. There's half past eight striking. Mytel, we've only just got time. Granny in vain implored them to stay a few minutes longer. No, we can't possibly, said Tiltil firmly. I promised light. And he hurried to take up the precious cage. Goodbye, Grandad. Goodbye, Granny. Goodbye, brothers and sisters, Pierrot, Robert, Pauling, Madeline, Cricket, and you too, Kiki. We can't stay. Don't cry, Granny. We will come back often. Poor old Grandad was very much upset and complained lustily. Gracious me, how tiresome the living are, with all their fuss and excitement. Tiltil tried to console him and again promised to come back very often. Come back every day, said Granny. It is our only pleasure and it's such a treat for us when your thoughts pay us a visit. Goodbye, 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 goodbye cried the brothers and sisters in chorus. Come back very come soon, come back very soon, come back Bring very us some soon, barley come sugar. back very soon. Bring us some barley sugar. There were more kisses. All waved their handkerchiefs, all shouted a last goodbye. Good goodbye. Goodbye. But the figures began to fade away. The little voices could no longer be heard. The two children were once more wrapped in mist, and the old forest covered them with its great dark mantle. Oh, I'm so frightened, whimpered Mytel. Give me your hand, little brother. I'm so frightened. Tiltil was shaking too, but it was his duty to try and comfort and console his sister. Hush, he said. Remember that we are bringing back the bluebird. As he spoke, a thin ray of light pierced the gloom, and the little boy hurried towards it. He was holding his cage tight in his arms, and the first thing he did was to look at his bird. Alas, and alack, what a disappointment awaited him. The beautiful bluebird in the land of memory had turned quite black. Oh, how well he knew the old blackbird that used to sing in its wicker prison in the old days at the doors of the house. What had happened? How painful it was, and how cruel life seemed to him just then. He had started on his journey with such zest and delight that he had not thought for a moment of the difficulties and dangers. Full of confidence, pluck and kindness, he marched off, certain of finding the beautiful bluebird which would bring happiness to the fairy's little girl. And now all his hopes were shattered. For the first time our poor friend understood the trials, the vexations and the obstacles that awaited him. Alas! Was he attempting an impossible thing? Was the fairy making fun of him? Would he ever find the bluebird? All his courage seemed to be leaving him. To add to his misfortunes, he could not find the straight road by which he had come. There was not a single white pansy on the ground, and he began to cry. Luckily, our little friends were not to remain in trouble long. The fairy had promised that light would watch over them. The first trial was over, and just outside the old people's house a little while ago, the mist now suddenly lifted. But instead of disclosing a peaceful picture, a gentle homely scene, it revealed a marvellous temple, with a blinding glare streaming from it. On the threshold stood Light, fair and beautiful in her diamond-coloured dress. She smiled when Tiltul told her of his first failure. She knew what the little ones were seeking. She knew everything. For Light surrounds all mortals with her love, though none of them is fond enough of her ever to receive her thoroughly and thus to learn all the secrets of truth. Now, for the first time, thanks to the diamond which the fairy had given to the boy, she was going to try and conquer a human soul. Do not be sad, she said to the children. Are you not pleased to have seen your grandparents? Is that not enough happiness for one day? Are you not glad to have restored the old blackbird to life? Listen to him singing. For the old blackbird was singing with his might and main, 
and his little yellow eyes sparkled with pleasure as he hopped about his big cage. As you look for the blue bird, dear children, accustom yourselves to love the grey birds, which you find on your way. She nodded her fair head gravely, and it was quite clear that she knew where the blue bird was. But life is often full of beautiful mysteries which we must respect, lest we should destroy them, and... If Light had told the children where the blue bird was, well, they would never have found him. I will tell you why at the end of this story. And now let us leave our little friends to sleep on beautiful white clouds under Light's watchful care. The end of chapter 3 The Land of Memory Read by Ian King is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Bluebird for Children Written by Georgette LeBlanc Edited by Frederick Orville Perkins Translated by Alexander Tirexir de Matos And read by Ian King Chapter 4 The Palace of Night some time after the children and their friends met at the first dawn to go to the palace of night where they hoped to find the bluebird several of the party failed to answer to their names when the roll was called milk for whom any sort of excitement was bad was keeping her room water sent an excuse she was accustomed always to travel in a bed of moss was already half dead with fatigue and was afraid of falling ill as for light she had been on bad terms with night since the world began, and fire, as a relation, shared her dislike. Light kissed the children and told Tylo the way, for it was his business to lead the expedition, and the little band set out upon its road. You can imagine dear Tylo trotting ahead on his hind legs, like a little man, with his nose in the air, his tongue dangling down his chin, his front paws folded across his chest. He fidgets, sniffs about, runs up and down, covering twice the ground without minding how tired it makes him. He is so full of his own importance that he disdains the temptations on his path. He neglects the rubbish heaps, pays no attention to anything he sees, and cuts all his old friends. Poor Tylo, he was so delighted to become a man, and yet he was no happier than before. Of course, life was the same to him, because his nature had remained unchanged. What was the use of his being a man if he continued to feel and think like a dog? In fact, his troubles were increased a hundredfold by the sense of responsibility that now weighed upon him. Oh, he said with a sigh, for he was joining blindly in his little god's search, without for a moment reflecting that the end of the journey would mean the end of his life. Oh, he said, if I got hold of that rascal of a bluebird, trust me, I wouldn't touch him even with the tip of my tongue not if he were as plump and as sweet as a quail red followed solemnly carrying the cage the two children came next and sugar brought up the rear but where was the cat to discover the reason of her absence we must go a little way back and read her thoughts at the time when tylette called a meeting of the animals and things in the fairy's hall she was contemplating a great plot which would aim at prolonging the journey but she had reckoned without the stupidity of her hearers. The idiots, she thought, have very nearly spoiled the whole thing by foolishly throwing themselves at the fairy's feet as though they were guilty of a crime. It is better to rely on oneself alone. In my cat life, all our training is founded on suspicion. I can see that it is just the same in the life of men. Those who confide in others are only betrayed. It is better to keep silent and to be treacherous one's self. As you see, my dear little readers, the cat was in the same position as the dog. She had not changed her soul and was simply continuing her former existence. But, of course, she was very wicked. Whereas our dear Tylo was, if anything, too good. Tylet therefore resolved to act on her own account and went, before daybreak, to call on Night, who was an old friend of hers. The road to the Palace of Night was rather long and rather dangerous. 
it had precipices on either side of it you had to climb up and climb down and then climb up again among high rocks that always seemed waiting to crush the passers-by at last you came to the edge of a dark circle and there you had to go down thousands of steps to reach the black marble underground palace in which night lived the cat who had often been there before raced along the road light as a feather her cloak borne on the wind streamed like a banner behind her the plume in her hat fluttered gracefully and her little grey kid boots hardly touched the ground she soon reached her destination and in a few bounds came to the great hall where night was it was really a wonderful sight night stately and grand as a queen reclined upon her throne she slept and not a glimmer not a star twinkled around her but we know that the night had no secrets for cats and that their eyes have the power of piercing the darkness so tylette saw night as though it were broad daylight before waking her she cast a loving glance at that motherly and familiar face it was white and silvery as the moon and its unbending features inspired both fear and admiration night's figure which was half visible through her long black veils was as beautiful as that of a greek statue she had long arms and a pair of enormous wings now furled and sleep came from her shoulders to her feet and gave her a look of majesty beyond compare still in spite of her affection for her best of friends tylette did not waste too much time in gazing at her it was a critical moment and time was short tired and jaded and overcome with anguish she sank upon the steps of the throne and meowed plaintively it is i mother of night i am worn out night is of an anxious nature and easily alarmed her beauty built up of peace and response possesses the secret of silence which life is constantly disturbing a star shooting through the sky a leaf falling to the ground the hoot of an owl a mere nothing is enough to tear the black velvet pall which she spreads over the earth each evening the cat therefore had not finished speaking when night sat up all quivering her immense wings beat around her and she questioned tylette in a trembling voice as soon as she had learned the danger that threatened her she began to lament her fate what a man's son coming to her palace and perhaps with the help of the magic diamond discovering her secrets what should she do what would become of her how could she defend herself and forgetting that she was sinning against the silence her own particular god night began to utter piercing screams it was true that falling into such a commotion was hardly likely to help her find a cure for her troubles likely for her tylette who was accustomed to the annoyance and worries of human life was better armed she had worked out her plan when going ahead of the children and she was hoping to persuade night to adopt it she explained this plan to her in a few words i see only one thing for it mother night as they are children we must give them such a fright that they will not dare to insist on opening the great door at the back of the hall behind which the birds of the moon live and generally the bluebird too the secrets of the other caverns will be sure to scare them the hope of our safety lies in the terror which you will make them feel there was clearly no other course to take but night had not time to reply for she heard a sound then her beautiful features contracted her wings spread out angrily and everything in her attitude told tylette that night approved of her plan here they are cried the cat the little band came marching down the steps of night's gloomy staircase tylo pranced bravely in front whereas tyltyl looked around him with an anxious glance he certainly found nothing to comfort him it was all very magnificent but very terrifying picture a huge wonderful black marble hall of a stern and tomb-like splendour there is no ceiling visible and the ebony pillars that surround the amphitheatre shoot up to the sky it is only when you lift your eyes up there that you catch the faint light falling from the stars everywhere the thickest darkness reigns two restless flames no more flicker on either side of night's throne before a monumental door of brass bronze doors show through the pillars to the right and left the cat rushed up to the children this way little master this way 
I have told tonight, and she is delighted to see you. Tylet's soft voice and smile made Tiltul feel himself again, and he walked up to the throne with a bold and confident step, saying, Good day, Mrs. Knight. Knight was offended by the word good day, which reminded her of her eternal enemy, Light, and answered dryly, Good day? I'm not used to that. You might say good night, or at least good evening. Our hero was not prepared to quarrel. He felt very small in the presence of that stately lady. He quickly begged her pardon as nicely as he could and very gently asked her leave to look for the bluebird in her palace. I have never seen him. He is not here, exclaimed Knight, flapping her great wings to frighten the boy. But when he insisted and gave no sign of fear, she herself began to dread the diamond, which by lighting up her darkness would completely destroy her power, and she thought it better to pretend to yield to an impulse of generosity and at once to point to the big key that lay on the steps of the throne. Without a moment's hesitation, Tiltil seized hold of it and ran to the first door of the hall. Everybody shook with fright. Bread's teeth chattered in his head. Sugar, who was standing some way off, moaned with mortal anguish. Mytel howled. Where is Sugar? I want to go home. Meanwhile, Tiltil, pale and resolute, was trying to open the door, while Knight's grave voice, rising above the din, proclaimed the first danger. It's the ghosts! Oh dear! thought Tiltil. I have never seen a ghost. It must be awful! The faithful Tylo by his side was panting with all his might, for dogs hate anything uncanny. At last the key grated in the lock. Silence reigned as dense and heavy as the darkness. No one dared draw a breath. Then the door opened, and in a moment the gloom was filled with white figures running in every direction. Some lengthened out right up to the sky. Others twined themselves around the pillars. Others wriggled ever so fast along the ground. They were something like men, but it was impossible to distinguish their features. The eye could not catch them. The moment you looked at them, they turned into a white mist. Tiltal did his best to chase them, for Mrs. Knight kept to the plan contrived by the cat and pretended to be frightened. She had been the ghost's friend for hundreds and hundreds of years and had only to say a word to drive them in again. But she was careful to do nothing of the sort, and, flapping her wings like mad, she called upon all her gods and screamed, Drive them away! Drive them away! Help! Help! But the poor ghosts, who hardly ever came out now that man no longer believed in them, were much too happy at taking a breath of air. And had it not been that they were afraid of Tylo, who tried to bite their legs, they would never have been put back indoors. Woof! gasped the dog when the door was shut at last. I have strong teeth, goodness knows, but chaps like those I never saw before. When you bite them, you'd think their legs were made of cotton. By this time, Tiltil was making for the second door and asking, What's behind this one? Knight made a gesture as though to put him off. Did the obstinate little fellow really want to see everything? Must I be careful when I open it? Asked Tiltil. No! Said Knight. It is not worthwhile. It's the sicknesses. They are very quiet, the poor little things. Man, for some time, has been waging such war upon them. Open and see for yourself. Tiltul threw the door wide open and stood speechless with astonishment. There was nothing to be seen. He was just about to close the door again when he was hustled aside by a little body in a dressing gown and a cotton nightcap who began to frisk about the hall, wagging her head and stopping every minute to cough, sneeze and blow her nose and to pull on her slippers, which were too big for her and kept dropping off her feet. Sugar, Bread and Tiltil were no longer frightened and began to laugh like anything, but they had no sooner come near the little person in the cotton nightcap than they themselves began to cough and sneeze. It's the least important of the sicknesses, said Knight. It's cold in the head. Oh dear! Oh dear! thought Sugar. If my nose keeps on running like this, I'm done for! I shall melt. Poor Sugar. He did not know where to hide himself. He had become very much attached to life since the journey began, for he had fallen over head and ears in love with water, and yet this love caused him the greatest worry. Miss Water was a tremendous flirt, 
expected a lot of attention and was not particular with whom she mixed but mixing too much with water was an expensive luxury as poor sugar found to his cost for at every kiss he gave her he left a bit of himself behind until he began to tremble for his life when he suddenly found himself attacked by a cold in the head he would have had to fly from the palace but for the timely aid of our dear tylo who ran after the little minx and drove her back into her cavern amidst the laughter of tyltyl and mytyl who thought gleefully that so far the trial had not been very terrible the boy therefore ran to the next door with still greater courage take care cried knight in a dreadful voice it's the wars they are more powerful than ever i don't think what would happen if one of them broke loose stand ready all of you to push back the door the knight had not finished uttering her warnings when the plucky little fellow repented his rashness he tried in vain to shut the door which he had opened an invincible force was pushing it from the other side streams of blood flowed through the cracks flames shot forth shouts oaths and groans mingled with the roar of cannon and the rattle of musketry everything in the palace of night was running about in wild confusion bread and sugar tried to take to flight but could not find the way out and they now came back to tiltul and put their shoulders to the door with despairing force the cat pretended to be anxious while secretly rejoicing this may be the end of it she said curling her whiskers they won't dare go on after this <laughs> dear tylo made superhuman efforts to help his little master while miltal stood crying in a corner at last our hero gave a shout of triumph hooray they're giving way victory victory the door is shut at the same time he dropped on the steps utterly exhausted dabbing his forehead with his poor little hands which shook with terror well asked knight harshly have you had enough did you see them yes yes replied the little fellow sobbing they are hideous and awful i don't think they have the bluebird you may be sure they haven't answered knight angrily if they had they would eat him at once you see there is nothing to be done tyltyl drew himself up proudly i must see everything he declared light said so it's an easy thing to say retorted knight when one's afraid and stays at home let us go to the next door said tyltyl resolutely what's in here this is where i keep the shades and the terrors tyltyl reflected for a minute as far as shades go he thought mrs knight is poking fun at me it's more than an hour since i've seen anything but shade in this house of hers and i shall be very glad to see daylight again as for the terrors if they are anything like the ghosts we shall have another good joke our friend went to the door and opened it before his companions had time to protest for that matter they were all sitting on the floor exhausted with the last fright and they looked at one another in astonishment glad to find themselves alive after such a scare meanwhile tyltyl threw back the door and nothing came out there's no one there he said yes there it is yes there is look out said knight who was still shamming fright she was simply furious she had hoped to make a great impression with her terrors and lo and behold the wretches who had so long been snubbed by man were afraid of him she encouraged them with kind words and succeeded in coaxing out a few tall figures covered in grey veils they began to run all around the hall until hearing the children laugh they were seized with fear and rushed indoors again the attempt had failed as far as night was concerned and the dread hour was about to strike already tyltyl was moving towards the big door at the end of the hall a few last words took place between them do not open that one said knight in awe-struck tones why not because it's not allowed then it's here that the bluebird is hidden go no further do not tempt fate do not open that door but why again asked tyltyl obstinately thereupon knight irritated by his persistence flew into a rage hurled the most terrible threats at him and ended by saying no one of those who have opened it were it by a hair's breadth but have ever returned alive to the light of day it means certain death and all the horrors all the terrors 
All the fears of which men speak on earth are as nothing compared with those which await if you, if you insist on touching that door. Don't do it, master, dear, said Bread with chattering teeth. Don't do it. Take pity on us. I implore you on my knees. You are sacrificing the lives of all of us, meowed the cat. I won't. I shan't, sobbed Mytel. Pity, pity, whined Sugar, wringing her fingers. All of them were weeping and crying. All of them crowded around Tiltil. Dear Tylo alone, who respected his little master's wishes, dared not speak a word, though he fully believed that his last hour had come. Two big tears rolled down his cheeks, and he licked Tiltil's hands in despair. It was really a most touching scene, and for a moment our hero hesitated. His heart beat wildly, his throat was parched with anguish. He tried to speak and could not get out a sound. Besides, he did not wish to show weakness in the presence of his hapless companions. If I have not the strength to fulfil my task, he said to himself, who will fulfil it? If my friends behold my distress, it's all up to me. They will not let me go through with my mission, and I shall never find the blue bird. At this thought, the boy's heart leaped within his breast, and all his generous nature rose in rebellion. It would never do to be, perhaps, within arm's reach of happiness, and not to try for it, at the risk of dying in the attempt, to try for it, and hand it over at last to all mankind. That settled it, Tiltil resolved to sacrifice himself like a true hero. He brandished the heavy golden key and cried, I must open the door. He ran up to the great door with Tylo panting by his side. The poor dog was half dead with fright, but his pride and his devotion to Tiltil obliged him to smother his fears. I shall stay, he said to his master. Uh, I'm not afraid. I, I shall stay with my little god. In the meantime, all the others had fled. Bread was crumbling to bits behind a pillar. Sugar was melting in a corner with Nytel in his arms. Knight and the cat, both shaking with fury, kept to the far end of the hall. Then Tiltil gave Tylo a last kiss, pressed him to his heart, and with never a tremble, put the key in the lock. Yells of terror came from all of the corners of the hall where the runaways had taken shelter, while the two leaves of the great door opened by magic in front of our little friend, who was struck dumb with admiration and delight. What an exquisite surprise! A wonderful garden lay before him, a dream garden filled with flowers that shone like stars, waterfalls that came rushing from the sky, and trees which the moon had clothed in silver. And then there was something whirling like a blue cloud among the clusters of roses. Tiltil rubbed his eyes. He could not believe his senses. He waited, looked again, and then dashed into the gardens, shouting like mad. Come quickly! Come quickly! They are here! We have them at last! Millions of bluebirds! Thousands of millions! Come, Mytil! Come, Tylo! Come all! Help me! You can catch them by the handfuls. Reassured at last, his friends came running up and all darted in among the birds, seeing who could catch the most. I've caught seven already, cried Mytel. I can't hold them. Nor can I, said Tiltil. I have too many of them. They're escaping from my arms. Tylo has some too. Let us go out. Let us go. Light is waiting for us. How pleased she will be. This way, this way! And they all danced and scampered away in their glee, singing songs of triumph as they went. Knight and the cat, who had not shared in the general rejoicing, crept back anxiously to the great door, and Knight whimpered. Haven't they got him? No, said the cat, who saw the real bluebird perched high on a moonbeam. They could not reach him. He kept too high. Our friends, all in a haste, ran up the numberless stairs between them and the daylight. Each of them hugged the birds which he had captured, never dreaming that every step which brought them nearer to the light was fatal to the poor things, so that by the time they came to the top of the staircase, they were carrying nothing but dead birds. Light was waiting for them anxiously. Well, have you caught him? She asked. Yes, yes, said Tiltil. Lots of them. There are thousands. Look. As he spoke, he held out the dear birds to her and saw, to his dismay, 
that they were nothing more than lifeless corpses their poor little wings were broken and their heads drooped sadly from their necks the boy in his despair turned to his companions alas they too were hugging nothing but dead birds then tyltyl threw himself sobbing in delight's arms once more all his hopes were dashed to the ground do not cry my child said light you did not catch the one that is able to live in broad daylight we shall find him yet of course of we, shall, course find we him. shall find him said bread and sugar with one voice they were great boobies both of them but they wanted to console the boy as for friend tylo he was so much put out that he forgot his dignity for a moment and looking at the dead birds exclaimed are they good to eat i wonder the party set out to walk back and sleep in the temple of light it was a melancholy journey all regretted the peace of home and felt inclined to blame tyltyl for his want of caution sugar edged up to bread and whispered in his ear don't you think mr chairman that all this excitement is very useless and bread who felt flattered at receiving so much attention answered promptly never you fear my dear fellow i shall put all this right life would be unbearable if we had to listen to all the whimsies of the little madcap to-morrow we shall stay in bed they forgot that but for the boy at whom they were sneering they would never have been alive at all and that if he had suddenly told bread that he must go back to his pan to be eaten and sugar that he was to be cut into small lumps to sweeten daddy till's coffee and mummy till's syrups they would have thrown themselves at their benefactor's feet and begged for mercy in fact they were incapable of appreciating their good luck until they were brought face to face with bad poor things the fairy berrylin when making them a present of their human life ought to have thrown in a little wisdom they were not so much to blame of course they were only following man's example given the power of speaking they jabbered knowing how to judge they condemned able to feel they complained they had hearts which increased their sense of fear without adding to their happiness as to their brains which could easily have arranged all the rest they made so little of them that they had already grown quite rusty and if you could have opened their heads and looked at the works of their life inside you would have seen the poor brains which were their most precious possessions jumping about at every movement they made and rattling in their empty skulls like dried peas in a pod fortunately light thanks to her wonderful insight knew all about their state of mind she determined therefore to employ the elements in things no more than she was obliged to they are useful she thought to feed the children and amuse them on the way but they must have no further share in the trials because they have neither courage nor conviction meanwhile the party walked on the road widened out and became resplendent and at the end the temple of light stood on a crystal height shedding its beams around the tired children made the dog carry them pick a back by turns and they were almost asleep when they reached the shining steps the end of chapter four the palace of night read by ian king bluebird for children this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Bluebird for Children by Georgette LeBlanc Translated by Alexandria Tirexa de Matos Chapter 5 The Kingdom of the Future Read by Ian King Tiltil and Mytil woke up next morning feeling very gay with childish carelessness. They had forgotten their disappointment. Tiltil was very proud of the compliments which Light had paid him. She seemed as happy as though he had brought the blue bird with him. She said with a smile as she stroked the lad's dark curls, I am quite satisfied. You are such a good, brave boy that you will soon find what you are looking for. Tiltil did not understand the deep meaning of her words, but for all that he was very glad to hear them. And besides, Light had promised him that today he would have nothing to fear in their new expedition. On the contrary, he would meet millions and millions of little children who would show him the most wonderful toys of which no one on earth had the least idea. 
She also told him that he and his little sister would travel alone with her this time and that all the others would take a rest while they were gone. This is why, at the moment when our chapter opens, they all met in the underground vaults of the temple. Light thought it as well to lock up the elements and things. She knew that if they were left to do as they pleased, they might escape and get into mischief. It was not so very cruel of her, because the vaults of her temple are even lighter and lovelier than the upper floors of human houses. But you cannot get out without her leave. She alone has the power of widening, with a stroke of her wand, a little cleft in the admiral wall at the end of the passage, through which you go down a few crystal steps till you come to a sort of cave, all green and transparent, like a forest when the sunlight sweeps through its branches. Usually this great hall was quite empty, but now it had sofas in it and a gold table laid with fruits and cakes and creams and delicious wines, which Light's servants had just finished setting out. Light's servants were very odd. They always made the children laugh with their long white satin dresses and their little black caps with a flame at the top. They looked like lighted candles. Their mistress sent them away and then told the animals and things to be very good and asked if they would like some books and games to play with. They answered with a laugh that nothing amused them more than eating and sleeping and that they were very glad to stay where they were. Tyler, of course, did not share this view. His heart spoke louder than his greed of his laziness, and his great dark eyes turned in entreaty on Tiltil, who would have been only too pleased to take his faithful companion with him, if Light had not absolutely forbidden it. I can't help it, said the boy, giving him a kiss. It seems that dogs are not admitted where we are going. Suddenly, Tylo sprang up with delight. A great idea had struck him. He had not left his real doggy life long enough to forget any part of it, especially his troubles, which was the greatest of these. Was it not the chain? What melancholy hours Tylo had spent fastened to an iron ring! and what humiliation he had endured when the woodcutter used to take him to the village and, with unspeakable silliness, keep him on the lead in front of everybody, thus depriving him of the pleasure of greeting his friends and sniffing the smells provided for his benefit at every street corner and in every gutter. Well, he said to himself, I shall have to submit to that humiliating torture once again to go with my little god. Faithful to his traditions, he had, in spite of his fine clothes kept his doggy collar but not his lead what was to be done he was once more in despair when he saw water lying on a sofa and playing in an absent-minded sort of way with her long strings and coral he ran up to her as prettily as he could and after paying her a heap of compliments begged her to lend him her biggest necklace she was in a good temper and not only did what he asked but was kind enough to fasten the end of the coral string to his collar Tylo gaily went up to his master, handing him this necklace chain, and kneeling at his feet, said, Take me with you like this, my little god. Men never say a word to a poor dog when he is on his chain. Alas, even like this you cannot come, said Light, who was much touched by this act of self-sacrifice, and to cheer him up she told him that fate would soon provide a trial for the children in which his assistance would be of great use. As she spoke these words, she touched the emerald wall, which opened to let her pass through with the children. Her chariot was waiting outside the entrance to the temple. It was a lovely shell of jade, inlaid with gold. They all three took their seats, and the two great white birds harnessed to it at once flew off through the clouds. The chariot travelled very fast, and they were not long on the road, much to the regret of the children, who were enjoying themselves and laughing like anything, but other and even more beautiful surprises awaited them. The clouds vanished around them, and suddenly they found themselves in a dazzling azure palace. Here all was blue, the light, the flagstones, the columns, the vaults, everything down to the smallest objects was of an intense and fairy-like blue. There was no seeing the end of the palace. The eyes were lost in the infinite sapphire vistas. How lovely it all is, said Tiltil, who could not get over his astonishment. Goodness me, how lovely! Where are we? We are in the kingdom of the future, said Light, in the midst of the children who are not yet born, as the diamond allows us to see clearly in this region which is hidden from men. We shall perhaps find the blue bird here. Look! Look at the children running up! From every side came bands of little children dressed from head to foot in blue. 
They had beautiful dark or golden hair and they were all exquisitely pretty. They shouted gleefully. Live children! Come and look at the little live children! Come and look at the little live children! Why do they call us the little live children? Asked Tiltil of Light. It is because they themselves are not alive yet. They are awaiting the hour of their birth. For it is from here that all the children come who were born upon our earth. When the fathers and mothers want children, the great doors which you see over there at the back are opened, and the little ones go down. What a lot there are! What a lot there are! cried Tiltil. There are many more, said Light. No one could count them, but a little further you will see other things. Tiltil did as he was told and our boat his way through, but it was difficult for him to move because a crowd of blue children pressed all around them. At last, by mounting on a step, our little friend was able to look over the throng of inquisitive heads and see what was happening in every part of the hall. It was most extraordinary. Tiltil had never dreamed of anything like it. He danced with joy and Mytil, who was hanging on to him and standing on tiptoe so that she might see too, clapped her little hands and gave loud cries of wonder. All around were millions of children in blue, some playing, others walking about, others talking or thinking. Many were asleep, many also were at work, and their instruments, their tools, the machines which they were building, the plants, the flowers and the fruits which they were growing or gathering were of the same bright and heavenly blue as the general appearance of the palace. Among the children moved tall persons also dressed in blue. They were very beautiful and looked like angels. They came up to light and smiled and gently pushed aside the blue children who went back quietly to what they were doing, though still watching our friends with astonished eyes. One of them, however, remained standing close to Tiltil. He was quite small. From under his long sky-blue silk dress peeped two little plink and dimpled bare feet. His eyes stared in curiosity at the little live boy, and he went up to him as though in spite of himself. May I talk to him? asked Tiltil, who felt half glad and half frightened. Certainly, said Light. You must make friends. I will leave you alone. You will be more at ease by yourself. So saying, she went away and left the two children face to face, shyly smiling. Suddenly they began to talk. How do you do? said Tiltil, putting out his hand to the child. But the child did not understand what that meant and stood without moving. What's that? continued Tiltil, touching the child's blue dress. The child, who was absorbed in what he was looking at, did not answer, but gravely touched Tiltil's hat with his finger. And that? he lisped. That? That's my hat, said Tiltil. Have you no hat? No. What is it for? asked the child. It's to say, how do you do with? Tiltil answered. And then, for when it's cold. What does that mean when it's cold? asked the child. When you shiver like this, brrr, brrr, said Tiltil. And when you go like this with your arms, vigorously beating his arms across his chest. Is it cold on earth? asked the child. Yes, sometimes in winter, where there is no fire. Why is there no fire? Because it's expensive and it costs money to buy wood. The child looked at Tiltil again as though he did not understand a word that Tiltil was saying, and Tiltil in his turn looked amazed. It's quite clear that he knows nothing of the most everyday things, thought our hero, while the child stared with no small respect at the little live boy who knew everything. Then he asked Tiltil what money was. Why, it's what you pay with, said Tiltil, scorning to give any further explanation. Oh, said the child seriously. Of course he did not understand. How could he know? A little boy like that, who lived in a paradise where his least wishes were granted before he had learned to put them into words. How old are you? asked Tiltil, continuing the conversation. I am going to be born soon, said the child. I shall be born in twelve years. Is it nice to be born? Oh, yes, cried Tiltil without thinking. It's great fun. But he was very much at a loss when the little boy asked him how he managed. His pride did not allow him to be ignorant of anything in another child's presence, and it was quite droll to see him with his hands in his breeches pockets, his legs wide apart, his face upturned, and his whole attitude that of a man who is in no hurry to reply. At last he answered with a shrug of the shoulders. Upon my word, I can't remember. It's so long ago. They say it's lovely, the earth 
and the live people remarked the child yes it's not bad said tyltyl there are birds and cakes and toys some have them all but those who have none can look at the others this reflection shows us the whole character of our little friend he was proud and inclined to be rather high and mighty but he was never envious and his generous nature made up to him for his poverty by allowing him to allow the good fortune of others the two children talked a good deal more but it would take too long to tell you all they said because what they said was sometimes only interesting to themselves after a while light who was watching them from a distance hurried up to them a little anxious tyltyl was crying big tears came rolling down his cheeks and falling on his smart coat she understood that he was talking of his grandmother and that he could not keep back his tears at the thought of the love which he had lost he was turning away his head to hide his feelings but the inquisitive child kept asking him questions do the grannies die what does that mean dying they go away one evening and do not come back has yours gone yes said tyltyl yes she was very kind to me and at these words the poor little fellow began to cry again the blue child had never seen anyone cry he lived in a world where grief did not exist his surprise was great and he exclaimed what's the matter with your eyes are they making pearls to him those tears were wonderful things no it's not pearls said tyltyl sheepishly what is it then but our poor friend would not admit what he looked upon as a weakness he rubbed his eyes awkwardly and put everything down to the dazzling blue of the palace the puzzled child insisted what's that falling down nothing it's a little water said tyltyl impatiently hoping to cut short the explanation but that was out of the question and the child was very obstinate touched tyltyl's cheeks with his fingers and asked in a tone of curiosity does it come from the eyes yes sometimes when one cries what does that mean crying asked the child i have not been crying said tyltyl proudly it's the fault of that blue but if i had cried it it would be the same thing do you often cry on earth not little boys but little girls do don't you cry here no i don't know how well you will learn at that moment a great breath of wind made him turn his head and he saw at a few steps away from him a large piece of machinery which he had not noticed at first as he was taken up with his interest in the little child it was a grand and magnificent thing but i cannot tell you its name because the inventions of the kingdoms of the future will not be christened by man until they reach the earth I can only say that Tyltyl, when he looked at it, thought that the enormous azure wings that whizzed so swiftly before his eyes were like the windmills in his part of the world, and that if he ever found the blue bird, its wings would certainly be no more delicate, dainty or dazzling. Full of admiration, he asked his new acquaintance what they were. Those? said the child. That's for the invention which I shall make on earth. And seeing Tyltyl stare with wide open eyes, he added, When I am on earth, I shall have to invent the things that gives happiness. Would you like to see it? It is over there, between those two columns. Tyltyl turned around to look, but all the children at once rushed at him, shouting, No, no, come and see mine. No, no. No, mine is much finer. No, come and see mine. Mine is wonderful invention. No mine is made of sugar his is no good i'm bringing a light which nobody knows of and so saying the last child lit himself up entirely with a most extraordinary flame amid these joyous exclamations the live children were dragged towards the blue workshops where each of the little inventors set his machine going it was a great blue whirl of discs and pulleys and straps and flywheels and driving wheels and cog wheels and all kinds of wheels which sent every sort of machine skimming over the ground or shooting up to the ceiling other blue children unfolded maps and plans or opened great big books or uncovered azure statues or bought enormous flowers and gigantic fruits that seemed made of sapphire and turquoises our little friends stood with their mouths wide open and their hands clasped together they thought themselves in paradise Mitel bent over to look at a huge flower and laughed into its cup which covered up her head like a hood of blue silk a pretty child with dark hair and thoughtful eyes held it by the stalk and said proudly 
the flowers will all grow like that when i am on the earth when will that be asked tiltil in fifty-three years four months and nine days next came two blue children bending under the weight of a pole from which there was slung a bunch of grapes each larger than a pear a bunch of pears cried tiltil no they are grapes said the child they will all be like that when i am thirty i have found the way tiltil would have loved to taste them but another child came along almost hidden under a basket which one of the tall persons was helping him to carry his fair-haired rosy face smiled through the leaves that hung over the wicker work look he said look at my apples but those are melons said tiltil no no said the child they are my apples they will all be alike when i am alive i have discovered the process i should never finish if i were to try and describe to my little readers all the wonderful and incredible things that appeared before our hero's eyes but suddenly a loud burst of laughter rang through the hall a child had spoken of the king of the nine planets and tiltil very much puzzled and perplexed looked on every side all the faces bright with laughter were turned to some spot which tiltil could not see every finger pointed in the same direction but our friend looked in vain they had spoken of a king he was looking for a throne with a tall dignified personage on it wielding a golden scepter over there over, over there. there lower down lower down behind you over there behind you said a thousand little voices together but where is but the king the king tiltil the mitel repeated greatly interested then suddenly a loud and more serious voice sounded above the silvery murmur of the others here i am it said proudly and at the same time tildul discovered a chubby baby which he had not yet remarked for it was the smallest and had kept out of the way till then sitting at the foot of a column in an attitude of indifference seemingly wrapped in contemplation the little king was the only one who had taken no notice of the live children his beautiful liquid eyes eyes as blue as the palace were pursuing endless dreams his right hand supported his head which was already heavy with thought his short tunic showed his dimpled knees and a golden crown rested on his yellow locks when he cried here i am the baby rose from the step on which he was sitting and tried to climb on to it at one stride but he was still so awkward that he lost his balance and he fell upon his nose he at once picked himself up with so much dignity that nobody dared make fun of him and this time he scrambled up on all fours and then putting his legs wide apart stood and eyed tiltil from top to toe you're not very big said tiltil doing his best to keep from laughing i shall do great things when i am retorted the king in a tone that admitted of no reply and what will you do asked tiltil i shall found the general confederation of the solar planets said the king in a very pompous voice our friend was so much impressed that he could not find a word to say and the king continued all the planets will belong to it except uranus saturn and neptune which are so ridiculously far away thereupon he toddled off the step again and resumed his first attitude showing that he had said all that he meant to say tiltil left him to his meditations he was eager to know as many more of the children as he could he was introduced to the discovery of a new son to the inventor of a new joy to the hero who was to wipe out injustice from the earth and to the wise acre who was to conquer death there were such lots and lots of them that it would take days and days to name them all our friend was rather tired and was beginning to feel bored when his attention was suddenly aroused by hearing a child's voice calling him till 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 how are you till till how are you a little blue child came running up from the back of the hall pushing his way through the crowd he was fair and slim and bright-eyed and had a great look of mitel how do you know my name asked tiltil it's not surprising said the blue child considering that i shall be your brother this time the live children were absolutely amazed what an extraordinary meeting they must certainly tell mummy as soon as they got back how astonished they would be at home while they were making these reflections the child went on to explain i am coming to you next year on palm sunday he said and he put a thousand questions to his big brother was it comfortable at home was the food good was daddy very severe and mummy oh mummy is, oh, so, mummy kind. is so kind said the little ones and they asked him questions in their turn what was he going to do on earth what was he bringing i am bringing three illnesses 
said the little brother. Scalatini, whooping cough, and measles. Oh, that's all, is it? cried Tiltil. He shook his head with evident disappointment, while the other continued. After that, I shall leave you. It will hardly be worth while coming, said Tiltil, feeling rather vexed. We can't pick and choose, said the little brother pettishly. They would perhaps have quarrelled without waiting till they were on earth if they had not suddenly been parted by a swarm of blue children who were hurrying to meet somebody. At the same time there was a great noise as if thousands of invisible doors were being opened at the end of the galleries. What's the matter? asked Tiltil. It's time. It's time, said one of the blue children. He's going to open the doors. And the excitement increased on every side. The children left their machines and their labourers. Those who were asleep woke up, and every eye was eager and anxiously turned to the great opal doors at the back, while every mouth repeated the same name. The word time, time, was heard all around, and the great mysterious noise kept on. Tiltil was dying to know what it meant. At last he caught a little child by the skirt of his dress and asked him, Let me be! said the child very uneasily. I'm in a hurry. It may be my turn today. It is the dawn rising. This is the hour when the children who are to be born today go to earth. You shall see. Time is drawing the bolts. Who is time? asked Tiltil. An old man who comes to call those who are going, said another child. He is not so bad, but he won't listen or hear. Beg as they may, if it's not their turn, he pushes back all those who try to go. Let me be. It may be my turn now. Light now hastened towards our little friends in a great state of alarm. I was looking for you. She said, Come, quick. It will never do for time to discover you. As she spoke these words, she threw her gold cloak around the children and dragged them to the corner of the hall where they could see everything without being seen. Tiltil was very glad to be so well protected. He now knew that he who was about to appear possessed so great and tremendous a power that no human strength was capable of resisting him. He was at the same time a deity and an ogre. He bestowed life, and he devoured it. He sped through the world so fast that you had no time to see him. He ate and ate, without stopping. He took whatever he touched. In Tiltil's family, he had already taken Grandad and Granny, the little brothers, the little sisters, and the old blackbird. He did not mind what he took, joys and sorrows, winters and summers. All was fish that came to his net. Knowing this, our friend was astonished to see everybody in the kingdom of the future running so fast to meet him. I suppose he doesn't eat anything here, he thought. There he was. The great doors turned slowly on their hinges. There was a distant music. It was the sounds of the earth. A red and green light penetrated into the hall, and time appeared on the threshold. He was a tall and very thin old man, so old that his wrinkled face was all grey, like dust. His white beard came down to his knees. In one hand he carried an enormous scythe, in the other an hourglass. Behind him, some way out on a sea of the colours of the dawn, was a magnificent gold galley with white sails. Are they ready? Whose hour has struck? asked Time. At the sound of that voice, solemn and deep as a bronze gong, thousands of bright children's voices, like the little silver bells, answered, Here we are! 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 And in a moment, the blue children were crowding around the tall old man who pushed them all back, and in a gruff voice said, One at a time! Once again, there are many more of you than are wanted! You can't deceive me! Brandishing his scythe on one hand and holding out his cloak with the other, he barred the way to the rash children who tried to slip by him. Not one of them escaped the horrid old man's watchful eye. It's not your turn, he said to one. You're to be born tomorrow, nor yours either. You've got ten years to wait. A thirteenth shepherd? There are only twelve wanted. There is no need for more. More doctors? There are too many already. They are grumbling about it on the earth. And where are the engineers? They want an honest man. Only one, as a wonderful being. Thereupon a poor child who was hung back until then came forward timidly, sucking his thumb. He looked pale and sad and walked with tottering footsteps. He was so wretched that even time felt a moment's pity. It's you, he exclaimed. You seem to be a very poor specimen. And in a moment, the blue children were crowding around the tall old man and lifting his eyes to the sky. With a look of discouragement, he added, You won't live long. And the moment went on. Each child, when denied, returned to his employment with a downcast air. 
when one of them was accepted the others looked at him with envy now and then something happened as when the hero who was to fight against the injustice refused to go he clung to his playfellows who called out to time he doesn't want to sir no i don't want to go cried the little fellow with all his might i would rather not be born and quite right too thought tiltil who was full of common sense and knew what things are like on earth for people always get beatings which they have not deserved and when they have done wrong you may be sure that the punishments will fall on one of the innocent friends i wouldn't care to be in his place said our friend to himself i would rather hunt for the blue bird any day meanwhile the little seeker after justice went away sobbing frightened out of his life by mr time the excitement was now at its height the children ran all over the hall those who were going packed up their inventions those who were staying behind had a thousand requests to make will you write to me will you write to me they say one can't oh try do try do try and now it's my idea good-bye jean good-bye piri good-bye jean have you forgotten anything don't lose your ideas try to tell us if it's nice enough enough roared time in a huge voice shaking his big keys and his terrible scythe enough the anchors weighed then the children climbed onto the gold galley with the beautiful white silk sails they waved their hands again to the little friends whom they were leaving behind them but on seeing the earth in the distance they cried out gladly earth 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 i can see it i can see it how bright it is how big it is how big it is and at the same time as though coming from the abyss a song rose a distant song of gladness and expectation light who was listening with a smile saw the look of astonishment on tiltil's face and bent over him it is the song of the mothers coming out to meet them she said at that moment time who had shut the doors saw our friends and rushed at them angrily shaking his scythe at them hurry said light hurry take the blue bird tiltil and go in front of me with my tilt. she put into the boy's arms a bird which she held hidden under her cloak and all radiant spreading her dazzling veil with her two hands she ran on protecting her charges from the onslaught of time in this way they passed through several turquoise and sapphire galleries it was magnificently beautiful but they were in the kingdom of the future where time was the great master and they must escape from his anger which they had braved mytel was terribly frightened and tiltil kept nervously turning around to light don't be afraid she said i am the only person who time has respected since the world began only mind that you take care of the blue bird he's gorgeous he is quite quite blue this thought entrapped the boy he felt the precious treasure fluttering in his arms his hands dared not press the pretty creature's soft warm wings and his heart beat against its heart this time he held the blue bird nothing could touch it because it was given to him by light herself what a triumph when he returned home he was so bewildered by his happiness that he hardly knew where he was going his joy rang a victorious peal in his head that made him feel giddy and he was mad with pride and this worse luck made him lose his coolness and his presence of mind they were just about to cross the threshold of the palace when a gust of wind swept through the entrance hall lifting up light's veil and at last revealing the two children to the eyes of time who was still pursuing them with a roar of rage he darted his scythe at tiltil who cried out light warded off the blow and the door of the palace closed behind them with a thud they were saved but alas tiltil taken by surprise had opened his arms and now through his tears saw the blue bird of the future soaring above their heads mingling with the azure sky its dream wings so blue so light and so transparent that soon the boy could make out nothing more chapter five of the blue bird the kingdom of the future read by ian king of the blooper for children this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the blooper for children by george leblanc translated by alexander de shura de mars chapter six in the temple of light tiltiot had enjoyed himself thoroughly in the kingdom of the future he had seen many wonderful things and thousands of little playfellows and then without taking the least pains or trouble had found the bluebird in his arms in the most magical way he had never pictured anything more beautiful more blue or brilliant and he still felt it fluttering against his heart 
and kept hugging his arms to his breast as though the bluebird were there alas it had vanished like a dream he was thinking sadly of this latest disappointment as he walked hand in hand with light they were back in the temple and were going to the vaults where the animals and things had been shut up what a sight met their eyes the wretches had eaten and drunk such a lot that were lying on the floor quite tipsy tilo himself had lost all his dignity he had rolled under the table and was snoring like a porpoise his instinct remained and the sound of the door made him prick up his ears he opened one eye but his sight was troubled by all that he had had a drink and he did not know his little master when he saw him he dragged himself to his feet with a great effort turned round several times and then dropped on the floor again with a grunt of satisfaction bread and the others were as bad and the only exception was the cat, who was sitting up prettily on a marble and gold bench and seemed in full possession of her senses. She sprang nimbly to the ground and stepped up to Tiltil with a smile. I have been longing to see you, she said, for I have been very unhappy among all these vulgar people. They first drank all the wine and then started shouting and singing and dancing, quarreling and fighting and making such a noise that I was very glad when at last fell into a tipsy sleep the children praised her warmly for her good behavior as a matter of fact there was no great merit in this for she could not stand anything stronger than milk but we are seldom rewarded when by right we ought to be and sometimes are when we have not deserved it after fondly kissing the children tilly asked a favor of light i've had such a wretched time she whined let me go out for a while it would do me good to be alone. Light gave her consent without suspecting anything, and a cat at once draped her cloak round her, put her head straight, pulled up her soft grey boots over her knees, opened the door, and ran and bounded out into the forest. We shall know a little later where treacherous Tillit was going so gaily, and what was the horrid plot which she was mysteriously concocting. As on the other days, the children had their dinner with light in a large room, all encrusted with diamonds. The servants bustled around them, smiling, and brought delicious dishes and cakes. After dinner, our little friends began to yawn. They felt sleepy very early after all their adventures. And light, ever kind and thoughtful, made them live as they were accustomed to on earth. So as not to injure their house by ordering their habits, she had set up their little beds in a part of the temple where the darkness would seem like night to them. They went through any number of rooms to reach their bedroom. They had first to pass all the lights known to men and then those which men did not yet know. There were great sumptuous apartments in splendid marble, lit up by rays so wide and strong that the children were quite dazzled. That is the light of the reach, said light to Tiltu. You see how dangerous it is. People run the risk of going blind when they live too much in its ray, which leave no room for soft and kindly shade. And she hurried them on so that they might rest their eyes in the gentle light of the pool. Here, the children suddenly felt as if they were in their parents' cottage, where everything was so humble and peaceful. The faint light was very pure and clear, but always flickering and ready to go out at the least breath. Next, they came to the beautiful light of the ports, which they liked immensely, for it had all the colors of the rainbow. And when you passed through it, you saw lovely pictures, lovely flowers, and lovely toys, which you were unable to take hold of. Laughing merrily, the children ran after birds and butterflies, but everything faded away as soon as it was touched. Well, I never, said Tiltil as he came panting back to light. This beats everything. I can't understand it. You will understand later, she replied. And if you understand it properly, you will be among the very few human beings who know the bluebird when they see him. After leaving the region of the ports, our friends reached the light of the land, which lies on the borders of the known and the unknown lights. Let's get on, said Tiltil. This is boring. To tell the truth, he was a little bit frightened, for they were in a long row of cold and forbidding arches, which were shrieked at every moment by dazzling lightning flashes. And at each flash, you saw out-of-the-way things that had no name as yet. After these arches, they came to the lights unknown to men, 
and Tiotio, in spite of the sleep that pressed upon his eyelids, could not help admiring the hall with its violet columns and the gallery with its red rays. And the violet of the columns was such a dark violet, and the red of the rays such a pale red, that it was hardly possible to see either of them. At last, they arrived at the room of smooth, unflecked black light, which men call darkness because their eyes are not yet able to make it out and here the children fell asleep without delay on two soft bays of clouds end of chapter six of the blue bird for children this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the blue bird for children by georgette leblanc translated by alexander tiahira de matos chapter seven when the children were not going on an expedition they played about in the realms of light and this was a great treat for them for the gardens and the country around the temple were as wonderful as the halls and galleries of silver and gold the leaves of some of the plants were so broad and strong that they were able to lie down on them and when a breath of wind stirred the leaves the children swung as in a hammock it was always summer there and never a moment was darkened by the night but the hours were known by their different colors there were pink white blue lilac green and yellow hours and according to their hues the flowers the fruits the birds the butterflies and the scents changed causing Tiltil and Mittil a constant surprise. They had all the toys that they could wish for. When they were tired of playing, they stretched themselves out on the backs of the lizards, which were as long and wide as little boats, and quickly, quickly raced round the garden path, over the sand which was as white and as good to eat as sugar. When they were thirsty, water shook her tresses into the cup of the enormous flowers, and the children drank straight out of the lilies, tulips, and morning glories. If they were hungry, they picked radiant fruits which revealed the taste of light to them, and which had juice that shone like the rays of the sun. There was also, in a clump of bushes, a white marble pond which possessed a magical power. Its clear waters reflected not the faces, but the souls of those who looked into it. "'It's a ridiculous invention,' said the cat, who steadily refused to go near the pond. "'You, my dear little readers, who know her thoughts as well as I do, will not be surprised at her refusal.' and you will also understand why our faithful Tillo was not afraid to go and quench his thirst there. He need not fear to reveal his thoughts, for he was the only creature whose soul never altered. The dear dog had no feelings but those of love and kindness and devotion. When Tiltil bent over the magic mirror, he almost always saw the picture of a splendid bluebird, for the constant wish to find him filled his mind entirely. Then he would run to light and entreat her, "'Tell me where he is!' You know everything. Tell me where to find him. But she replied, in a tone of mystery, I cannot tell you anything. You must find him for yourself. And kissing him, she added, Cheer up. You are getting nearer to him at each trial. Now there came a day on which she said to him, I have received a message from the fairy Berylune, telling me that the bluebird is probably hidden in the graveyard. It appears one of the dead in the graveyard is keeping him in his tomb. "'What shall we do?' asked Tiltil. "'It is very simple. At midnight you will turn the diamond, and you shall see the dead come out of the ground.' At these words, milk, water, bread, and sugar began to yell and scream and chatter their teeth. "'Don't mind them,' said Light to Tiltil in a whisper. "'They are afraid of the dead.' "'I'm not afraid of them,' said Fire, frisking about. "'Time was when I used to burn them. That was much more amusing than nowadays. Oh, I feel like I'm going to turn.' wailed Milk. "'I'm not afraid,' said the dog, trembling in every limb. "'But if you run away, I shall run away too, and with the greatest pleasure.' The cat sat pulling at her whiskers. "'I know what's what,' she said in her usual mysterious way. "'Be quiet,' said Light. "'The fairy gave strict orders. You are all to stay with me at the gate of the graveyard. The children are to go on alone.' Tiltil felt anything but pleased. He asked, "'Aren't you coming with us?' "'No,' said Light. "'The time for that has not arrived. "'Light cannot yet enter among the dead. "'Besides, there is nothing to fear. "'I shall not be far away, 
and those who love me and whom I love always find me again. She had not finished speaking when everything around the children changed. The wonderful temple, the dazzling flowers, the splendid gardens vanished to make way for a poor little country cemetery, which lay in the soft moonlight. Near the children were a number of graves, grassy mounds, wooden crosses, and tombstones. Tiltil and Mittil were seized with terror and hugged each other. "'I am frightened!' said Mittil. "'I am never frightened!' stammered Tiltil, who was shaking with fear but did not like to say so. "'I say,' asked Mittil, "'are the dead wicked?' "'Why, no,' said Tiltil. "'They're not alive.' "'Have you ever seen one?' "'Yes, once long ago, when I was very young.' "'What was it like?' "'Quite white, very still, and very cold, and it didn't talk. "'Are we going to see them?' Tiltil shuddered at this question, and made an unsuccessful effort to steady his voice as he answered. "'Why, of course, Light said so.' "'Where are the dead?' asked Middle. Tiltil cast a frightened look around him, for the children had not dared to stir since they were alone. "'The dead are here,' he said, "'under the grass or under those big stones.' "'Are those the doors of their houses?' asked Middle, pointing to the tombstones. "'Yes. Do they go out when it's fine? They can only go out at night. Why? Because they are in their nightshirts. Do they go out also when it rains? When it rains, they stay at home. Is it nice in their homes? They say it's very cramped. Have they any children? Why, yes, they have all those who die. And what do they live on?' Tiltil stopped to think before answering. As Middle's big brother, he felt it his duty to know everything, but her questions often puzzled him. Then he reflected that, as the dead live underground, they can hardly eat anything that is above it, and so he answered very positively. They eat roots! Miltil was quite satisfied, and returned to the great question that was occupying her little mind. Shall we see them? she asked. Of course, said Tiltil. We see everything when I turn the diamond. And what will they say? Tiltil began to grow impatient. They will say nothing, as they don't talk. Why don't they talk? asked Middle. Because they have nothing to say, said Tiltil, more cross and perplexed than ever. Why have they nothing to say? This time the little big brother lost all patience. He shrugged his shoulders, gave Middle a push, and shouted angrily, You're a nuisance! Mittil was greatly upset and confused. She sucked her thumb and resolved to hold her tongue for ever after, as she had been so badly treated. But a breath of wind made the leaves of the trees whisper and suddenly recalled the children to their fears and their sense of loneliness. They hugged each other tight and began to talk again, so as not to hear the horrible silence. "'When will you turn the diamond?' asked Middle. "'You heard Light say that I was to wait until midnight, because that disturbs them less. It is when they come out to take the air.' "'Isn't it midnight yet?' Tiltil turned around, saw the church clock, and hardly had the strength to answer, for their hands were just upon the hour. "'Listen,' he stammered. "'Listen. Is it just going to strike? There, do you hear?' And the clock struck twelve. Then Mittil, frightened out of her life, began to stamp her feet and utter piercing screams. "'I want to go away! I want to go away!' Tiltil, though stiff with fright, was able to say— not now. I am going to turn the diamond. No, 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 cried Mittil. I am so afraid, little brother. Don't do it. I want to go away. Tiltil vainly tried to lift his hand. He could not reach the diamond with Mittil clinging to him, hanging with all her weight on her brother's arm and screaming at the top of her voice. I don't want to see the dead. They will be awful. I can't possibly. I'm much too frightened. Poor Tiltil was quite as much terrified as Mittil. But at each trial his will and courage were becoming greater. He was learning to master himself, and nothing could induce him to fail in his mission. The eleventh stroke rang out. "'The hour is passing!' he exclaimed. "'It is time!' And releasing himself resolutely from Middle's arms, he turned the diamond. A moment of terrible silence followed for the poor little children. Then they saw the crosses totter, the mounds open, the slabs rise up, Middle hid her face against Tiltil's chest. "'They're coming out!' she cried. "'There! There! There! There!' The agony was more than the plucky little fellow could endure. He shut his eyes and only kept himself from fainting by leaning against a tree beside him. 
He remained like that for a moment that seemed to him like a century, not daring to move, not daring to breathe. Then he heard birds singing, a warm and scented breeze fanned his face, and on his hands, on his neck, he felt the soft heat of the balmy summer sun. Now, quite reassured, but unable to believe in so great a miracle, he opened his eyes and at once began to shout with happiness and admiration. From all the open tombs came thousands of splendid flowers. They spread everywhere, on the paths, on the trees, on the grass, and they went up and up until it seemed that they would touch the sky. They were great full-blown roses showing their hearts, wonderful golden hearts, from which came the hot, bright rays which had wrapped Tiltil in that summer warmth. Round the roses birds sang and bees buzzed gaily. "'I can't believe it! It's not possible!' said Tiltil. "'What has become of the tombs and the stone crosses?' Dazzled and bewildered, the two children walked hand in hand through the graveyard, of which not a trace remained, for there was nothing but a wonderful garden on each side. They were as glad and happy as could be, after their terrible fright. They had thought that ugly skeletons would rise from the earth and run after them, pulling horrid faces. They had imagined all sorts of awful things. And now, in the presence of the truth, they saw that all that they had been told was a great big story and that death did not exist. They saw that there are no dead, and that life goes on always, always, but under fresh forms. The fading rose sheds its pollen, which gives birth to other roses, and its scattered petals scent the air. The fruits come when the blossoms fall from the trees, and the dingy, hairy caterpillar turns into a brilliant butterfly. Nothing perishes, there are only changes. Beautiful birds circled all around Tiltil and Mittil. There were no blue ones among them, but the two children were so glad of their discovery that they asked for nothing more. Astonished and delighted, they kept on repeating, There are no dead! There are no dead! End of chapter 7「of the Bluebird for Children. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. The Bluebird for Children by Georgette Leblanc. Translated by Alexander Tisseria de Matos. Chapter 8 The Forest. As soon as Tiltil and Mittil were in bed, light kissed them, and faded away at once, so as not to disturb their sleep, with the rays that always streamed from her beautiful self. It must have been about midnight when Tiltil, who was dreaming of the little blue children, felt a soft, velvet paw pass to and fro over his face. He was surprised, and sat up in bed in a bit of a fright, but he was soon reassured when he saw his friend Tillet's glowing eyes glittering in the dark. Hush, said the cat in his ear. Hush, don't wake anybody. If we can arrange to slip out without being seen, we shall catch the bluebird tonight. I have risked my life, O oh, my dearest master, in preparing a plan which will certainly lead us to victory. But, said the boy, kissing Tillet. Light would be so glad to help us, and besides, I should be ashamed to disobey her. If you tell her, said the cat, sharply, all is lost, believe me. Do as I say, and the day is ours. As she spoke these words, she hastened to dress him, and also Mittel, who had heard a noise and was asking to go with them. You don't understand, groaned Tiltil. You are too small. You don't know what a wicked thing we are doing. But the treacherous cat answered all his arguments, saying that the reason why he had not found the bluebird so far was just the fault of Light, who always brought brightness with her. Let the children only go hunting by themselves, in the dark, and they would soon find all the bluebirds that make men's happiness. The traitress displayed such cleverness that, before long, Tiltil's disobedience became a very fine thing in his own eyes. Each of Tillet's words provided a good excuse for his action, or adorned it with a generous thought. 
he was too weak to set his will against trickery, allowed himself to be persuaded, and walked out of the temple with a firm and cheerful step. Poor little fellow! If he could only have foreseen the terrible trap that awaited him! Our three companions set out across the fields in the white light of the moon. The cat seemed greatly excited, did nothing but talk, and went so fast that the children were hardly able to keep up with her. This time, she declared, we shall have the bluebird. I am sure of it. I asked all the trees in the oldest forest. They know him, and he hides among them. Then, in order to have everybody there, I sent the rabbit to beat the assembly and call the principal animals in the country. They reached the edge of the dark forest in an hour's time. Then, at a turn in the road, they saw, in the distance, some one who seemed to be hurrying towards them. Tillet arched her back. She felt that it was her old enemy. She quivered with rage. Was he once more going to thwart her plans? Had he guessed her secret? Was he coming, at the last moment, to save the children's lives? She leaned over to Tiltil and whispered to him in her most honeyed voice, I am sorry to say it is our worthy friend, the dog. It is a thousand pities, because his presence will make us fail in our object. He is on the worst of terms with everybody, even the trees. Do tell him to go back. Go away, you ugly thing, said Tiltil, shaking his fist at the dog. Dear old faithful Tillo, who had come because he suspected the cat's plans, was much hurt by these hard words. He was ready to cry, was still out of breath from running, and could think of nothing to say. "'Go away, I tell you,' said Tiltil again. "'We don't want you here, and there's an end of it. You're a nuisance. There.' The dog was an obedient animal, and, at any other time, he would have gone, but his affection told him what a serious business it was, and he stood stock still. "'Do you allow this disobedience?' said the cat to Tiltil in a whisper. "'Hit him with your stick.' Tiltil beat the dog, as the cat suggested. "'There! That will teach you to be more obedient,' he said. The poor dog howled at receiving the blows, but there was no limit to his self-sacrifice. He went up to his young master pluckily and, taking him in his arms, cried, I must kiss you now you've beaten me. Tiltil, who was a good-hearted little fellow, did not know what to do, and the cat swore beneath her teeth like a wild beast. Fortunately, dear little Mittil interfered on our friend's behalf. No, no, I want him to stay, she pleaded. I'm frightened when Tillo's not with us. Time was short, and they had to come to a decision. I'll find some other way to get rid of the idiot, thought the cat, and, turning to the dog, she said, in her most gracious manner, We shall be so pleased if you will join us. As they entered the great forest, the children stuck close together, with the cat and the dog on either side of them. They were awed by the silence and the darkness, and they felt much relieved when the cat exclaimed, "'Here we are! Turn the diamond!' Then the light spread around them and showed them a wonderful sight. They were standing in the middle of a large round space in the heart of the forest, where all the old, old trees seemed to reach up to the sky. Wide avenues formed a white star amidst the dark green of the wood. Everything was peaceful and still, but suddenly a strange shiver ran through the foliage. The branches moved and stretched like human arms. The roots raised the earth that covered them, came together, took the shapes of legs and feet, and stood on the ground. A tremendous crash rang through the air. The trunks of the trees burst open, and each of them let out its soul, 
which made its appearance like a funny human figure. Some stepped slowly from their trunks, others came out with a jump, and all of them gathered inquisitively round our friends. The talkative poplar began to chatter like a magpie. "'Little men! We shall be able to talk to them. We have done with silence. Where do they come from? Who are they?' And so he rattled on. The lime-tree, who was a jolly, fat fellow, came up calmly, smoking his pipe. The conceited and dandified chestnut-tree screwed his glass into his eye to stare at the children. He wore a coat of green silk, embroidered with pink and white flowers. He thought the little ones too poor-looking, and turned away in derision. He thinks he's everybody, since he has taken to living in town. He despises us sneered the poplar, who was jealous of him. "'Oh, dear! oh, dear!' wept the willow, a wretched little stunted fellow, who came clattering along in a pair of wooden shoes too big for him. "'They have come to cut off my head and arms for firewood!' Tiltil could not believe his eyes. He never stopped asking the cat questions. "'Who's this? Who's that?' until it introduced the soul of each tree to him. There was the elm, who was a sort of short-winded, paunchy, crabby gnome, the beech, an elegant, sprightly person, the birch, who looked like the ghosts in the palace of night, with his white flowing garments and his restless gestures. The tallest figure was the fir-tree. Tiltil found it very difficult to see his face perched right at the top of his long, thin body, but he looked gentle and sad, whereas the cypress, who stood near him, dressed all in black, frightened Tiltil terribly. However, so far nothing very dreadful had happened. The trees, delighted at being able to talk, were all chattering together, and our young friend was simply going to ask them where the bluebird was hidden, when all of the sudden silence reigned. The trees bowed respectfully and stood aside to make way for an immensely old tree, dressed in a long gown embroidered with moss and lichen. He leaned with one hand on a stick and with the other on a young oak sapling who acted as his guide, for the old oak was blind. His long white beard streamed in the wind. "'It's the king,' said Tiltil to himself, when he saw his mistletoe crown. "'I will ask him the secret of the forest.' And he was just going up to him, when he stopped, seized with surprise and joy. There sat the bluebird before him, perched on the old oak's shoulder. "'He has the bluebird!' cried the boy, gleefully. "'Quick, quick, give him to me!' Silence! Hold your tongue, said the greatly shocked trees. Take off your hat, Tiltil, said the cat. It's the oak. The poor child at once obeyed with a smile. He did not understand the danger that threatened him, and he did not hesitate to answer, Yes, sir, when the oak asked him if he was Till, the woodcutter's son. Then the oak, trembling with rage, began to lay a terrible charge against Daddy Till. "'In my family alone,' he said, "'your father has put to death six hundred of my sons, four hundred and seventy-five uncles and aunts, twelve hundred cousins of both sexes, three hundred and eighty daughters-in-law, and twelve thousand great-grandsons.' No doubt his anger made him exaggerate a little, but Tiltil listened without protest, and said, very politely, "'I beg your pardon, sir, for disturbing you. The cat said that you would tell us where the bluebird is.' The oak was too old not to know all there was to know about men and animals. He smiled in his beard when he guessed the trap laid by the cat, and he felt very glad at it, for he had long wished to revenge the whole forest for the slavery to which man had subjected it. "'It's for the fairy Beruluna's little girl, who is very ill,' the boy continued. "'Enough!' said the oak, 
silencing him. I do not hear the animals. Where are they? All this concerns them as much as us. We, the trees, must not assume the responsibility alone for the grave measures that have become necessary. Here they come, said the fir tree, looking over the top of the other trees. They are following the rabbit. I can see the souls of the horse, the bull, the ox, the cow, the wolf, the sheep, the pig, the goat, and the bear. All the animals now arrived. They walked on their hind legs, and were dressed like human beings. They solemnly took up their positions in a circle among the trees, all except the frivolous goat, who began to skip down the avenues, and the pig, who hoped to find some glorious truffles, among the roots that had newly left the ground. "'Are all here present?' asked the oak. "'The hen could not leave her eggs,' said the rabbit. "'The hare was out for a run. The stag has pains in his horns and his corns. The fox is ill. Here is the doctor's certificate. The goose did not understand, and the turkey flew into a passion.' Look, whispered Tiltil to Mytil, aren't they funny? They are just like the rich cousin's fine toys in the windows at Christmas time. The rabbit especially made them laugh, with his cocked hat over his big ears, his blue embroidered coat, and his drum slung in front of him. Meanwhile, the oak was explaining the situation to his brothers, the trees, and to the animals. Treacherous Tillette, had been quite right in reckoning on their hatred. "'The child you see before you,' said the oak, "'thanks to a talisman stolen from the powers of earth, "'is able to take possession of our bluebird, "'and thus to snatch from us the secret "'which we have kept since the origin of life. "'Now we know enough of man to entertain no doubt "'as to the fate which he reserves for us "'once he is in possession of this secret.' any hesitation would be both foolish and criminal. It is a serious moment. The child must be done away with before it is too late. "'What is he saying?' asked Tiltil, who could not make out what the old tree was driving at. The dog was prowling round the oak, and now showed his fangs. "'Do you see my teeth, you old cripple?' he growled. "'He is insulting the oak!' said the beech indignantly. "'Drive him out!' shouted the oak angrily. "'He's a traitor!' "'What did I tell you?' whispered the cat to Tiltil. "'I will arrange things, but send him away.' "'Will you be off?' said Tiltil to the dog. "'Do let me worry the gouty old beggar's moss slippers,' begged Tilo. Tiltil tried in vain to prevent him. The rage of Tilo, who understood the danger, knew no bounds, and he would have succeeded in saving his master if the cat had not thought of calling in the ivy, who till then had kept his distance. The dog pranced about like a madman, abusing everybody. He railed at the ivy. Come on, if you dare, you old ball of twine, you. The onlookers growled. The oak was pale with fury at seeing his authority denied. The trees and the animals were indignant. But, as they were cowards, not one of them dared protest. And the dog would have settled all of them, if he had gone on with his rebellion. But Tiltil threatened him harshly, and, suddenly yielding to his docile instincts, Tillo lay down at his master's feet. Thus it is that our finest virtues are treated as faults when we exercise them without discrimination. From that moment the children were lost. The ivy gagged and bound the poor dog, who was then taken behind the chestnut tree and tied to his biggest root. Now, cried the oak, in a voice of thunder, we can take counsel quietly. This is the first time that it is given us to judge man. I do not think that, after the monstrous injustice which we have suffered, there can remain the least doubt as to the sentence that awaits him. One cry rang from every throat. Death! 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 The poor children did not at first understand their doom, for the trees and animals, 
who were more accustomed to talking their own special language, did not speak very distinctly, and, besides, the innocent children could never imagine such cruelty. "'What is the matter with them?' asked the boy. "'Are they displeased?' "'Don't be alarmed,' said the cat. "'They are a little annoyed because spring is late.' And she went on talking into Tiltil's ear, to divert his attention from what was happening. While the trusting lad was listening to her fibs, the others were discussing which form of execution would be the most practical and the least dangerous. The bull suggested a good butt with the horns. The beech offered his highest branch to hang the little children on, and the ivy was already preparing a slipknot. The fir-tree was willing to give the four planks for the coffin, and the cypress the perpetual grant of a tomb. "'By far the simplest way,' whispered the willow, "'would be to drown them in one of my rivers.' And the pig grunted between his teeth. "'In my opinion, the great thing would be to eat the little girl. She ought to be very tender.' "'Silence!' roared the oak. What we have to decide is which of us shall have the honour of striking the first blow. That honour falls to you, our king, said the fir-tree. Alas, I am too old, replied the oak. I am blind and infirm. To you, my evergreen brother, be the glory, in my place, of striking the decisive blow that shall set us free but the fir-tree declined the honour on the pretext that he was already to have the pleasure of burying the two victims, and that he was afraid of rousing jealousy. He suggested the beech as owning the best club. "'It is out of the question,' said the beech. "'You know I am worm-eaten. Ask the elm and the cypress.' Thereupon the elm began to moan and groan. Her mole had twisted his great toe the night before, and he could hardly stand upright, and the cypress excused himself, and so did the poplar, who declared that he was ill and shivering with fever. Then the oak's indignation flared up. "'You are afraid of man!' he exclaimed. "'Even those unprotected and unarmed little children inspire you with terror. Well, I shall go forth alone, old and shaky and blind as I am, against the hereditary enemy. Where is he? And groping his way with his stick, he moved towards Tiltil, growling as he went. Our poor little friend had been very much afraid during the last few minutes. The cat had left him suddenly, saying that she wanted to smooth down the excitement, and had not come back. Mittel nestled tremblingly against him, and he felt very lonely very unhappy among those dreadful people whose anger he was beginning to notice. When he saw the oak marching on him with a threatening air, he drew his pocket-knife and defied him like a man. "'Is it I he's after, the old one with the big stick?' he cried. But at the sight of the knife, man's irresistible weapon, all the trees shook with fright and rushed at the oak to hold him back. There was a struggle, and the old king— conquered by the weight of years, threw away his stick. "'Shame on us!' he shouted. "'Shame on us! Let the animals deliver us!' The animals were only waiting for this. All wanted to be revenged together. Fortunately, their very eagerness caused a scrimmage which delayed the murder of the dear little ones. Mittel uttered piercing screams. "'Don't be afraid,' said Tiltil doing his best to protect her. I have my knife. The little chap means to die game, said the cock. That's the one I shall eat first, said the pig, eyeing Miltil greedily. What have I done to all of you? asked Tiltil. Nothing at all, my little man, said the sheep. Eaten my little brother, my two sisters, my three uncles, my aunt, my grandpapa, and my grandmamma. Wait, wait, when you're down, you shall see that I have teeth also. And so the sheep and the horse, who were the greatest cowards, waited for the little fellow to be knocked down before they dared to take their share in the spoil. While they were talking, the wolf and the bear treacherously attacked Tiltil from behind and pushed him over. It was an awful moment. 
all the animals seeing him on the ground tried to get at him the boy raised himself to one knee and brandished his knife mittel uttered yells of distress and to crown all it suddenly became dark tyltyl called wildly for assistance help help tillo tillo to the rescue where's tillet come come the cat's voice was heard in the distance where she was craftily keeping out of sight i can't come she whined i'm wounded all this time plucky little tyltyl was defending himself as best he could but he was alone against all of them felt that he was going to be killed and in a faltering voice cried once more help tillo tillo i can't hold out there are too many of them the bear the pig the wolf the fir tree the birch tillo 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 then the dog came leaping along dragging his broken bonds and elbowing his way through the trees and animals and flung himself before his master whom he defended furiously here my little god don't be afraid have at them i know how to use my teeth all the trees and animals raised a loud outcry renegade idiot traitor felon simpleton sneak leave him he's a dead man come over to us the dog fought on never never i alone against all of you never never true to the gods to the best to the greatest take care my little master here's the bear look out for the bull tyltyl vainly tried to defend himself i'm done for tillo it was a blow from the elm my hands bleeding and he dropped to the ground no i can hold out no longer they are coming said the dog i hear somebody we are saved it is light saved saved see they're afraid they're retreating saved my little king and sure enough light was coming towards them and with her the dawn rose over the forest which became light as day what is it what has happened she asked quite alarmed at the sight of the little ones and their dear tillo covered with wounds and bruises why my poor boy didn't you know turn the diamond quickly tyltyl hastened to obey and immediately the souls of all the trees rushed back into their trunks which closed upon them the souls of the animals also disappeared and there was nothing to be seen but a cow and a sheep browsing peaceably in the distance the forest became harmless once more and tyltyl looked around him in amazement no matter he said but for the dog and if i hadn't had my knife light thought that he had been punished enough and did not scold him besides she was very much upset by the horrible danger which he had run tyltyl mytyl and the dog glad to meet again safe and sound exchanged wild kisses they laughingly counted their wounds which were not very serious tillet was the only one to make a fuss the dog's broken my paw she mewed tillo felt as if he could have made a mouthful of her never mind he said it'll keep leave her alone will you you ugly beast said mittel our friends went back to the temple of light to rest after their adventure tyltyl repenting of his disobedience dared not even mention the blue bird of which he had caught a glimpse and light said to the children gently let this teach you dears that man is all alone against all in this world never forget that end of chapter eight of the blue bird for children this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by eric metzler the blue bird for children 
by Georgette Leblanc, translated by Alexander Teixeira de Matos. Chapter 9 The Leave Taking Weeks and months had passed since the children's departure on their journey, and the hour of separation was at hand. Light had been very sad lately. She had counted the days in sorrow, without a word to the animals and things, who had no idea of the misfortune that threatened them. On the day when we see them for the last time, they were all out in the gardens of the temple. Light stood watching them from a marble terrace, with Tiltil and Mittil sleeping by her side. Much had happened in the past twelve months, but the life of the animals and things, which had no intelligence to guide it, had made no progress, on the contrary. Bread had eaten so much that he was now not able to walk. Milk, devoted as ever, dragged him along in a bath-chair. Fire's nasty temper had made him quarrel with everybody, and he had become very lonely and unhappy in consequence. Water, who had no will of her own, had ended by yielding to Sugar's sweet entreaties. They were now married, and Sugar presented a most piteous sight. The poor fellow was reduced to a shadow of his former self, shrank visibly day by day, and was sillier than ever, while Water, in marrying, had lost her principal charm, her simplicity. The cat had remained the liar that she always was, and our dear friend Tilo had never been able to overcome his hatred for her. Poor things, thought Light, with a sigh, they have not gained much by receiving the benefit of life. They have travelled and seen nothing of all the wonders that surrounded them in my peaceful temple. They were either quarrelling with one another or overeating themselves until they fell ill. They were too foolish to enjoy their happiness, and they will recognise it for the first time presently, when they are about to lose it. At that moment a pretty dove with silver wings alighted on her knees. It wore an emerald collar round its neck, with a note fastened to the clasp. The dove was the fairy Berelune's messenger. Light opened the letter and read these few words. Remember that the year is over. Then Light stood up, waved her wand, and everything disappeared from sight. A few seconds later, the whole company were gathered together outside a high wall with a small door in it. The first rays of the dawn were gilding the treetops. Tiltil and Mittel, whom Light was fondly supporting with her arms, woke up, rubbed their eyes, and looked around them in astonishment. What? said Light to Tiltil. Don't you remember that wall and that little door? The sleepy boy shook his head. He remembered nothing. Then Light assisted his memory. The wall, she said, surrounds a house which we left one evening just a year ago today. Just a year ago? Why, then? And, clapping his hands with glee, Tiltil ran to the door. We must be near Mummy. I want to kiss her at once, at once, at once. But Light stopped him. It was too early, she said. Mummy and Daddy were still asleep, and he must not wake them with a start. Besides, she added, the door will not open till the hour strikes. What hour? asked the boy. The hour of separation, Light answered, sadly. What? said Tiltil, in great distress. Are you leaving us? I must, said Light. The year is past. The fairy will come back and ask you for the blue bird. But I haven't got the blue bird, cried Tiltil. The one of the land of memory turned quite black. The one of the future flew away. The knights are dead. Those in the graveyard were not blue, and I could not catch the one in the forest. Will the fairy be angry? What will she say? Never mind, dear, said Light. You did your best, and though you did not find the bluebird, you deserved to do so, for the good will, pluck, and courage which you showed. Light's face beamed with happiness as she spoke these words, for she knew that to deserve to find the bluebird was very much the same thing as finding it. But she was not allowed to say this, for it was a beautiful mystery, which Tiltil had to solve for himself. She turned to the animals and things, who stood weeping in a corner, and told them to come and kiss the children. 
Bread at once put down the cage at Tiltil's feet and began to make a speech. "'In the name of all, I crave permission. "'You shan't have mine,' cried Fire. "'Order!' cried Water. "'We still have tongues of our own,' roared Fire. "'Yes, yes!' screamed Sugar, who, knowing that his end was at hand, kept kissing Water and melting before the other's eyes. Poor Bread in vain tried to make his voice heard above the din. Light had to interfere and command silence. Then Bread spoke his last words. "'I am leaving you,' he said between his sobs. "'I am leaving you, my dear children, and you will no longer see me in my living form. Your eyes are about to close to the invisible life of things. But I shall be always there, in the bread-pan, on the shelf, on the table, beside the soup. I who am, if I may say so, the most faithful companion, the oldest friend of man.' "'Well, and what about me?' shouted Fire angrily. "'Silence,' said Light. "'The hour is passing. Be quick and say good-bye to the children.' Fire rushed forward, took hold of the children, one after the other, and kissed them so violently that they screamed with pain. "'Oh, oh, he's burning me! Oh, oh, he scorched my nose!' "'Let me kiss the place and make it well,' said Water, going up to the children gently. This gave Fire his chance. "'Take care,' he said. "'You'll get wet.' "'I'm loving and gentle,' said Water. "'I'm kind to human beings.' "'What about those you drown?' asked Fire. But Water pretended not to hear. "'Love the wells. Listen to the brooks,' she said. "'I shall always be there. When you sit down in the evening, beside the springs, try to understand what they are trying to say.' Then she had to break off, for a regular waterfall of tears came gushing from her eyes flooding all around her. However, she resumed, Think of me when you see the water bottle. You will find me also in the ewer, the watering can, the cistern, and the tap. Then Sugar came up with a limping walk, for he could hardly stand on his feet. He uttered a few words of sorrow in an affected voice and then stopped. For tears, he said, were not in harmony with his temperament. Humbug! cried Bread. Sugar plum! "'Lollipop! Caramel!' yelped Fire. And all began to laugh, except the two children, who were very sad. "'Where are Tillet and Tillo gone to?' asked our hero. At that moment the cat came running up, in a terrible state. Her hair was on end and disheveled, her clothes were torn, and she was holding a handkerchief to her cheek, as though she had the toothache. She uttered terrible groans, and was closely pursued by the dog who overwhelmed her with bites, blows, and kicks. The others rushed in between them to separate them, but the two enemies continued to insult and glare at each other. The cat accused the dog of pulling her tail and putting tin tacks in her food and beating her. The dog simply growled and denied none of his actions. "'You've had some,' he kept saying. "'You've had some, and you're going to have some more.' But suddenly he stopped, and, as he was panting with excitement, it could be seen that his tongue turned quite white. Light had told him to kiss the children for the last time. "'For the last time?' stammered poor Tillo. "'Are we to part from these poor children?' His grief was such that he was incapable of understanding anything. "'Yes,' said Light, "'the hour which you know of is at hand. We are going to return to silence.' Thereupon the dog, suddenly realizing his misfortune, began to utter real howls of despair and fling himself upon the children, whom he loaded with mad and violent caresses. "'No, no!' he cried. "'I refuse! I refuse! I shall always talk, and I shall be very good. You will keep me with you, and I will learn to read and write and play dominoes. And I shall always be very clean, and I shall never steal anything in the kitchen again!' He went on his knees before the two children, sobbing and entreating, and when Tiltil, with his eyes full of tears, remained silent, dear Tillo had a last magnificent idea. Running up to the cat, he offered with smiles that looked like grins to kiss her. Tillet, who did not possess his spirit of self-sacrifice, leaped back and took refuge by Mittel's side. Then Mittel said innocently, You, Tillet, are the only one that hasn't kissed us yet. The cat put on a mincing tone. Children, said she, I love you both as much as you deserve. There was a pause. And now, said Light, let me in my turn give you a last kiss. As she spoke, she spread her veil round them as 
if she would have wrapped them for the last time in her luminous might. Then she gave them each a long and loving kiss. Tiltil and Miltil hung on to her beseechingly. "'No, no, no, Light!' they cried. "'Stay here with us. Daddy won't mind. We will tell Mummy how kind you have been. Where will you go all alone?' "'Not very far, my children,' said Light. "'Over there to the land of the silence of things.' "'No, no,' said Tiltil. "'I won't have you go.' But Light quieted them with a motherly gesture and said words to them which they never forgot. Long after, when they were a grandfather and grandmother in their turn, Tiltil and Mittel still remembered them and used to repeat them to their grandchildren. Here are Light's touching words. Listen, Tiltil, do not forget, child, that everything that you see in this world has neither beginning nor end. If you keep this thought in your heart and let it grow up with you, you will always, in all circumstances, know what to say, what to do, and what to hope for. And when our two friends began to sob, she added lovingly, Do not cry, my dear ones. I have not a voice like water. I have only my brightness, which man does not understand. But I watch over him to the end of his days. Never forget that I am speaking to you in every spreading moonbeam, in every twinkling star, in every dawn that rises, in every lamp that is lit, in every good and bright thought of your soul. At that moment, the grandfather's clock in the cottage struck eight o'clock. Light stopped for a moment, and then, in a voice that grew suddenly fainter, whispered, "'Good-bye, good-bye. The hour is striking. Good-bye.' Her veil faded away. Her smile became paler. Her eyes closed. Her form vanished, and, through their tears, the children saw nothing but a thin ray of light dying away at their feet. Then they turned to the others, but these had disappeared. End of chapter 9 Recording by Eric Metzler, Albuquerque, New Mexico, United States of America Of the Blue Bird for Children This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Karina Pereira. The Blue Bird for Children by Georgette Leblanc. Translated by Alexander Teixeira de Matos. The Awakening. The grandfather's clock in Till, the woodcutter's cottage, had struck eight and his two little children, Tiltil and Mitil, were still asleep in their little beds. Mummy Till stood looking at them, with her arms akimbo and her prone tucked up, laughing and scolding in the same breath. I can't let them go on sleeping till midday, she said. Come, get up, you little lazy bones. But it was no use shaking them, kissing them, or pulling the bad clothes off them. They kept on falling back upon their pillows, with their noses pointing at the ceiling, their mouths wide open, their eyes shut, and their cheeks all pink. At last, after receiving a gentle thump in the ribs, Tiltil opened one eye and murmured, What? Light? Where are you? No, no, don't go away! Light! cried Mummy Till, laughing. Why, of course it's light. Has been for ever so long. What's the matter with you? You look quite blinded. Mummy, mummy, said Tiltil, rubbing his eyes. It's you. Why, of course it's I. Why do you stare at me in that way? Is my nose turned upside down by any chance? Tiltil was quite awake by this time and did not trouble to answer the question. He was beside himself with the light. It was ages and ages since he had seen his mummy, and he never tired of kissing her. Mummy Till began to be uneasy. What could the matter be? Had a boy lost his senses? Here he was, suddenly, talking of a long journey in the company of the fairy and water and milk and sugar and fire and bread and light. 
he made believe that he had been away a year. But you haven't left the room, cried Mummy Till, who was now nearly beside herself with fright. I put you to bed last night, and here you are this morning. It's Christmas Day. Don't you hear the bells in the village? Of course, it's Christmas Day, said Tiltil obstinately, seeing that I went away a year ago on Christmas Eve. You're not angry with me? Did you feel very sad? And what did Daddy say? Come, you're still asleep, said Mummy Till, trying to take comfort. You've been dreaming. Get up and put on your breeches and your little jacket. Hello, I've got my shirt on, said Tiltil. And, leaping up, he knelt down on the bed and began to dress, while his mother kept on looking at him with a scared face. The little boy rattled on. Ask me, Till, if you don't believe me. Oh, we have had such adventures. We saw Grandad and Granny, yes, in the land of memory. It was on our way. They are dead, but they are quite well, aren't they, Mittil? And Mittil, who was now beginning to wake up, joined her brother in describing their visit to the grandparents and the fun which they had had with their little brothers and sisters. This was too much for Mummy Till. She ran to the door of the cottage and called with all her might to her husband, who was working on the edge of the forest. Oh dear, oh dear, she cried. I shall lose them as I lost the others. Do come, come quick. Daddy Till soon entered the cottage with his axe in his hand. He listened to his wife's lamentations while the two children told the story of their adventures over again and asked him what he had done during the year. You see? You see? said Mummy Till, crying. They have lost their heads. Something will happen to them. Run and fetch the doctor. But the woodcutter was not the man to put himself out for such a trifle. He kissed the little ones, calmly lit his pipe and declared that they looked very well and that there was no hurry. At that moment, there came a knock at the door and a neighbour walked in. She was a little old woman leaning on a stick and very much like the fairy Berry Loon. The children at once flung their arms around her neck and capered round her, shouting merrily, It's the fairy Berry Loon! The neighbour, who was a little hard of hearing, paid no attention to their cries and said to Mummy Till, I have come to ask for a bit of fire for my Christmas too. It's very chilly this morning. Good morning, children. Meanwhile, Tiltil had become a little thoughtful. No doubt, he was glad to see the old fairy again. But what would she say when she heard that he had not the blue bird? He made up his mind like a man and went up to her boldly. Fairy Berry Loon, I could not find the blue bird. What is he saying? asked the neighbour, quite taken aback. Thereupon, Mummy Till began to fret again. Come, Till Till, don't you know Goody Berlingot? Why, yes, of course, said Till Till, looking the neighbour up and down. It's the fairy Berry Loon. Berry what? asked the neighbour. Berry Loon, answered Till Till, calmly. Berlingot, said the neighbour. You mean Berlingot? Tiltil was a little put out by a positive way of talking, and he answered, Berylune or Berlingot, as you please, ma'am, but I know what I'm saying. Daddy Till was beginning to have enough of it. We must put a stop to this, he said. I will give them a smack or two. Don't, said the neighbour. It's not worth while. It's only a little fit of dreaming. They must have been sleeping in the moonbeams. My little girl who is very ill is often like that. Mummy Till put aside her own anxiety for a moment and asked after the health of the neighbour Bellingot's little girl. She's only so-so, said the neighbour, shaking her head. She can't get up. The doctor says it's her nerves. I know what would cure her, for all that. She was asking me for it only this morning for a Christmas present. She hesitated a little, looked at Tiltil with a sigh, and added, in a disheartened tone, What can I do? It's a fancy she has. The others looked at one another in silence. They knew what the neighbor's words meant. Her little girl had long been saying that she would get well if Tiltil would only give her his dove. But he was so fond of it that he refused to part with it. Well, said Mummy Till to her son, 
Won't you give your bird to that poor little thing? She has been dying to have it for ever so long. My bird, cried Tiltil, slapping his forehead as though they had spoken of something quite out of the way. My bird, he repeated. That's true, I was forgetting about him. And the cage. Mitil, do you see the cage? It's the one which Brett carried. Yes, yes, it's the same one. There it is, there it is. It's the blue bird we were looking for. We have been miles and miles and miles, and he was here all the time. Tiltil would not believe his eyes. He took a chair, put it under the cage, and climbed onto it gaily, saying, Of course, I'll give him to her. Of course I will. Then he stopped, in amazement. Why, he's blue, he said. It's my dove, just the same, but he has turned blue while I was away. And our hero jumped down from the chair and began to skip for joy, crying. It's the blue bird we were looking for. We have been miles and miles and miles, and he was here all the time. He was here at home. Oh, but how wonderful. Mittil, do you see the bird? What would light say? There, Madam Berlingot, take him quickly to your little girl. While he was talking, Mummy Till threw herself into her husband's arms and moaned. You see? You see? He's taken bad again, he's wandering. Meantime, neighbour Berlingot beamed all over her face, clasped her hands together and mumbled her thanks. When Tiltil gave her the bird, she could hardly believe her eyes. She hugged the boy in her arms and wept with joy and gratitude. Do you give it me? She kept saying. Do you give it me like that, straight away and for nothing? Goodness, how happy she will be. I fly, I fly. I will come back to tell you what she says. Yes, yes, go quickly, said Tiltil, for some of them change their colour. Neighbour Berlingot ran out and Tiltil shut the door after her. Then he returned round on the threshold, looked at the walls of the cottage, looked all around him and seemed wonderstruck. Daddy, Mummy, what have you done to the house? he asked. It's just as it was, but it's much prettier. His parents looked at each other in bewilderment, and the little boy went on. Why, yes, everything has been painted and made to look like new. Everything is clean and polished. And look at the forest outside the window. How big and fine it is. One would think it was quite new. How happy I feel here. Oh, how happy I feel. The worthy woodcutter and his wife could not make out what was coming over their son. But you, my dear little readers, who have followed Tiltil and Mittil through their beautiful dream, will have guessed what it was that altered everything in our young hero's view. It was not for nothing that the fairy, in his dream, had given him a talisman to open his eyes. He had learned to see the beauty of things around him. He had passed through trials that had developed his courage. While pursuing the blue boat, the bird of happiness that was to bring happiness to the fairy's little girl. He had become open-handed and so good-natured that the mere thought of giving pleasure to others filled his heart with joy. And, while travelling through endless, wonderful, imaginary regions, his mind had opened out to life. The boy was right when he thought everything more beautiful, for, to his richer and purer understanding, Everything must needs seem infinitely fairer than before. Meanwhile, Tiltil continued his joyful inspection of the cottage. He leaned over the bread pan to speak a kind word of the loaves. He rushed at Tilo, who was sleeping in his basket, and congratulated him on the good fight which he had made in the forest. Mitil stooped down to stroke Tilet, who was snoozing by the stove, and said, well, Tillet, you know me, I see, but you have stopped talking. Then Tiltil put his hand up to his forehead. Hello, he cried. The diamond's gone. Who's taking my little green hat? Never mind, I don't want it any more. Ah, there's fire. Good morning, sir. He'll be crackling to make water angry. He ran to the tap, turned it on and bent down over the water. Good morning, water. Good morning. What does she say? She still talks, but I don't understand her as well as I did. Oh, how happy I am. 
how happy I am. So am I, so am I, cried Mithil. And our two young friends took each other's hands and began to scamper round the kitchen. Mummy Till felt a little relieved at seeing them so full of life and spirits. Besides, Daddy Till was so calm and placid. He sat eating his porridge and laughing. You see, they are playing at being happy, he said. Of course, the poor dear man did not know that a wonderful dream had taught his little children not to play at being happy, but to be happy, which is the greatest and most difficult of lessons. I like light best of all, said Tiltil to Mithil, standing on tiptoe by the window. You can see her over there through the trees of the forest. Tonight she will be in the lamp. Dear, oh dear, how lovely it all is and how glad I feel. How glad I... He stopped and listened. Everybody lent an ear. They heard laughter and merry voices. And the sounds came nearer. It's her voice, cried Tiltil. Let me open the door. As a matter of fact, it was the little girl with her mother, neighbor Berlingot. Look at her, said Goody Berlingot, quite overcome with joy. She can run, she can dance, she can fly. It's a miracle. When she saw the bird, she jumped just like that. And Goody Berlingot hopped from one leg to the other, at the risk of falling and breaking a long, hooked nose. The children clapped their hands and everybody laughed. The little girl was there, in a long white night dress, standing in the middle of the kitchen, a little surprised to find herself on her feet after so many months' illness. She smiled and pressed Tiltil's dove to her heart. Tiltil looked first at the child, and then at Mithil. Don't you think she's very like light? He asked. She is much smaller, said Mithil. Yes, indeed, said Tiltil. But she will grow. And the three children tried to put a little food down the bird's beak, while the parents began to feel easier in their minds and looked at them and smiled. Tiltil was radiant. I will not conceal from you, my dear little readers, that the dove had hardly changed colour at all, and that it was joy and happiness that decked him with a magnificent bright blue plumage in our hero's eyes. No matter. Tiltil, without knowing it, had discovered Light's great secret, which is that we draw nearer to happiness by trying to give it to others. But now something happened. Everybody became excited. The children screamed. The parents threw up their arms and rushed to the open door. The bird had suddenly escaped. He was flying away as fast as he could. My bird! My bird! sobbed the little girl. But Tiltil was the first to run to the staircase and he returned in triumph. It's all right, he said. Don't cry. He's still in the house and we shall find him again. And he gave a kiss to the little girl who was already smiling through her tears. You'll be sure to catch him again, won't you? she asked. Trust me, replied our friend confidentially. I know where he is. You also my dear little readers, now know where the bluebird is. Their light revealed nothing to the woodcutter's children, but she showed them the road to happiness by teaching them to be good and kind and generous. Suppose that, at the beginning of this story, she had said to them, Go straight back home. The bluebird is there, in the humble cottage, in the wicker cage, with your dear father and mother who love you. The children would never have believed her. What? Tiltil would have answered. The blue bird, my dove. Nonsense. My dove is grey. Happiness in the cottage with daddy and mummy. Oh, I say. There are no toys at home and it's awfully boring there. We want to go ever so far and meet with tremendous adventures and have all sorts of fun. That is what he would have said. And he and Mithil would have set out in spite of everything, without listening to Light's advice, for the most certain truths are good for nothing if we do not put them to the test ourselves. It only takes a moment to tell a child all the wisdom in the world. 
but our whole lives are not long enough to help us understand it because our own experience is our only light each of us must seek out happiness for himself and he has to take endless pains and undergo many a cruel disappointment before he learns to become happy by appreciating the simple and perfect pleasures that are always within easy reach of his mind and heart. The end. End of The Awakening Recording by Karina Pereira End of The Blue Bird for Children by Georgette Leblanc Translated by Alexander Teixeira de Matos